Very good. Did you guys have a good week? Everybody busy at work? Yeah. Angela, where are you working exactly? Is that in Pickering? Are you enjoying picking up into iPad crawl or is it challenging? Yeah. So what were you doing before you got into iPad? Wow, that's a lot of roles, Angela. <laughs> yep, and you have to switch them just as things do change in a day, right? Sometimes they're just coming and going. You feel like your head is going to explode. <laughs> Certainly is a different time for IPAC than entering the field five or ten years ago. Now it's a little bit, everything is on, on its side, I find. But um, it's exciting time to see that there is appetite to grow the field and give a more of a center stage role to the practitioners and not overwhelm one person with multiple roles. It's, it's actually quite refreshing to see that. Karine, where are you working? What's your role right now? Hello, Is Cornelia. Talk, right? Hi. <laughs> Easier I to just, talk than type, it right? It <laughs> is. It is because I'm a slow typer. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Yeah. I enjoyed your last class. How are you all doing? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm good. I was a little bit stressed that we had so many technical difficulties last week, and I was really uh -huh. concerned with, um, with the way we had to torture Leonard to mm -hmm. convert everything. So it was, I, I was a little bit worried about last week. <laughs> it's okay. I, but I'm glad you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah. so I think this is going to be, uh, this class is going to be a little bit um, more of an intro into what we really do and mm -hmm. kind of putting more meat on, on what you encounter every day, really. I see. Um, yeah. Well, in terms of my background, I 
came to Canada as an IMG and I um, was lucky enough to um, study and get qualified as a sonographer. Then mm -hmm. um, I decided, I started, um, because of the COVID, I was asked to become a safety officer. Uh -huh. And um, in working as a safety officer, I just became really interested in like auditing and watching mm -hmm. um, best practices. And I was like, wow. I didn't even realize we had a, you know, a, a, a great IPAC unit at our hospital. And I was like, wow, this is something that I would really want to do. And so <laughs> I started to find out about how to get qualified as a practitioner. And then mm -hmm. here I am today. Yeah, well, welcome. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a completely different world. And I find that mm -hmm. sometimes it's unknown what we do. I remember yeah. often being told, oh, you just walk around. I want your job. <laughs> 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 People just like see us walk onto the units and right. there's only that sliver in a day that they see you. And they all they mm -hmm. every time we are we are visible, we are walking mm -hmm. from one point to the other. So mm -hmm. it's very hard to comprehend how deep the program yeah. actually run and how how huge yes. the responsibilities are. So yes. it's it's um it's interesting to see when somebody new comes in and how mm -hmm. Their mm -hmm. eyes open to the world right. of IPAC. It's quite exciting. Yes. I enjoy yeah. hearing yeah. when yeah. people have that revelation yeah. in sure. front You're of right. them. Yeah. Yes, yes. Hi, Simi. How are you? Hello, Leonard. Hi, how's it going? So good. How are you? Yeah, good. Uh, so, yeah, I got my screen capture. It's actually working this time. So, <laughs> Yahoo! And, uh, Perfect. Like I'm, yeah, I'm using like a uh, uh, different. Um, uh, a different software package. So hopefully this will work and um, yeah, it'll do its job hopefully. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I'm just keeping my eye on uh, on the emails. If anyone yeah. emails us saying they have trouble or any issues. Uh, I just sent a rather comprehensive uh, uh, email in regard to different browsers, where to mm -hmm. go, download and and all that kind of stuff, and uh, so all the good stuff. Yeah, all that good stuff. Hopefully, it'll go a little more smoother today. Like, uh, guys, just for example, I'm using uh, Brave browser on Linux uh, using Zorin OS, actually, more precisely. Uh, that's what I'm using right now. So. Uh, uh, and I have tested on 
tons of different platforms, tons of different uh, browsers with uh, 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 with varying success uh, and failures and stuff like that. <laughs> so if you guys are like me, use uh, like really weird operating systems. Like uh, uh, at home, I have like uh, uh, Haiku OS, if you guys oh. don't, uh, ever heard of that. Uh, Amiga OS, remember the Commodore Amiga? Yeah, uh, that and uh, the Raspberry Pi, um, 3B Plus and the 4 and you name it. So uh, uh, so I've probably already tested it or, um, uh, or, or can figure it out uh, as far as like alternative uh, platforms and uh, so like uh, BSD, you name it. So. Anywho, I'll hand it off to you there, uh, 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 Cornelia. Yeah, it helps when I do unmute myself to speak, right? Hello, everybody. Welcome on our Friday session. I just want to say thank you all for being patient with us for over the past week. We have had a lot of technical difficulties. And um, thanks to Leonard, we have our class from the last week up. And um, I know he's put a lot of work to make sure that we have smooth sailing this week and hopefully things work work out as they should. Um, so I just want to say thank you all to, for participating in this week's chat. I know I didn't put much on for the discussion for the week two, but uh, there are some requests to open earlier week three. People are getting a little bit anxious about the time and all um, work that is regular. And then on top of it, we have, of course, our assignments here. So I have opened it. And um, I want to say thank you to Anita for creating our SWOT analysis. That's pretty cool. And uh, so this week, we will actually be using that format to put in some answers. And then towards the end of the week, we will summarize it and come up with a very clear recommendation to our imaginary retirement home and how to create our imaginary IPAC team. Don't worry, Angela, about the posting. As I said, um, I put the the timelines I put more so we are not getting overwhelmed with mixing the discussions but it seemed that people are getting really um, anxious to get into week three so I opened it earlier this week to see how that works so we, as we go we will go by feel and I will hear from you what you find that is working or not working and we can tweak as we go this is just this course is supposed to serve us and get us where we need to be and i'm just um facilitating and steering your knowledge and pointing at the directions that are marked with the little ipac flags so you'll see everything we go through you heard you know you it's nothing going to be extremely new for you it's just how are we going to tweak your knowledge in in a fashion that will be um, applicable to what you do in future Okay, all right, so let's start with our infection prevention and control. So this week is week three. We are starting with IPAC um, program and development and a little bit of a history of IPAC. So the idea of this week is to discuss the role and duties of IPAC team and IPAC committee, but also we will touch on the roles of IPAC practitioners, and then for all of you that are brand new in the field, I, I think you will find this exciting and interesting topic for development of your IPAC program. So you probably have found some types of programming and that may need to be adjusted in some fashion or um, maybe you're lucky so it's a perfect program, but let's take it uh, on our journey. Okay, 
So I'm just going to ask you guys, I think we started this discussion also in the chat, what does infection control mean to you and um, how did you get into the field and why do you think IPAC is important? So take it away, who wants to tell me why, what does IPAC mean to you? I'll mute myself, give us a couple of minutes. Hi, this is Brunette. Um, IPAC means to me that not just um, healthcare workers, but everyone um, is responsible um, for infection control to make sure um, that we're taking the necessary precautions and the necessary measures to be able to um, curve whatever is out there, um, whether it's true hand hygiene or um, all the all the infection measures that um, we've been taught or we've been listening to, um, we have to just make sure that we're protecting ourselves and others. Um, in my role, basically, I was the IPAC lead, even though I didn't have um, the formal education like what we're doing here. I was responsible for training and for making sure that all departments in the retirement home that I worked at um, were trained um, in infection control, especially during the height of the pandemic. Um, um, I, go in, I took this course because I had some time off. I had to take a break um, because I was like jumping from one COVID home to another. Um, helping out with IPAC and uh, a lot of audits. Um, so I decided to educate myself more on um, IPAC because it is so, so important now to, to have that knowledge behind all these infections that are going on. Um, so I decided to <laughs> do, become an IPAC a practitioner because um, I love I love the field anyways. I love the field of nursing, but um, I want to delve more into knowing how to deal with um, this kind of situation. And I'm not I'm not going to lie about it. Um, I'm looking to go into something more. And when I see all the public health um, um, job posting, they're looking for an IPAC. Um, practitioner, not just a nurse or an RPN or an RN, you, they want certified persons. So this is where it's leading. Everybody wants a certified practitioner, right? Yeah. So you will yeah. see that and you know, everyone that is here knows that it is kind of catch 22 to get certified. You need to work in a field to be certified and then you need to be certified to work in a field. So yeah. it's a little bit of a, of a loop for us to get in, but you, you guys are all in, in good place to, to, to get there. No, so Anita, uh, IPAC teams are actually built differently across, I would say across country, but uh, I can speak more about Ontario, that's where I'm located, and I think most of you guys are. So um, any teams would benefit from actually having a variety of representation. So you can have, of course, a nurse, they're always our backbone of any team in, in, in healthcare, of course. But um, you you would want to benefit also having somebody with a lab background, somebody who can crunch the numbers. Usually your public health background will is usually good with statistics, epidemiology. So depending on the size of the team, you may have something like even a project person. Um, you, you may have a differently structured department that will have a variety of teams. So you don't have to be just nurse. There is there is cell facilities that are um, asking for nurses exclusively to be in their IPAC teams. There's some still in GTA. That said, there is some that are sticking to only um, 
professionally certified like nurses and uh, micro lab background. So with public health inspectors, we are not what is considered a professional in, in the industry. So we are not licensed professionals. So a lot of facilities kind of start would like to to stay away from that thinking about more about the liability but um truly it's we all are professionals in the field and when we are deciding to to work in this field we take it very seriously all right so uh, i see sharon is typing and rosemary is typing so let's see what those two ladies will will share with us and then we can maybe move forward so, um, shared notes. Okay, there is, there's a lot of typing going on. So let me give you a couple of more minutes and then we can move along. Um, so I will tell you about my background. I'm a public health inspector by education and training. I have um, attended a medical school in Serbia where I got my public health degree. And then when I moved to Canada, I could not get certified in public health because the Canadian um, Public Health Institute only recognizes Canadian schools. And so I had to go back to school to get degree in Canada so I could get certified. So I attended Ryerson and um, I took a public health school at Ryerson bachelor's degree. And then after two years of accelerated program, I finally qualified to become certified public health inspector. And then um, once I completed that, of course, I always go into these circles of working and getting into school and working and getting into school. So I decided to take my master's and I did my master's in food safety and quality assurance at Guelph. And um, then I got <laughs> Sharon, high five indeed. <laughs> and um, then uh, after that, once I was working in the field about I would say maybe about five years or so, I felt that my experience is not as full as I was hoping because with, within the public health inspection, the unit that I worked in was a general program, but we weren't at that time, we weren't involved with the IPAC piece of um, investigations of outbreaks. So it was mostly nursing staff that was looking after that. So I was really, really interested in what they're doing there. So I took my um, centennial course. And um, then after that, I landed my first IPAC job and uh, got certified within actually less than two years because my public health job uh, has landed itself into that two year of experience that one needs. Uh, so you asked me about the associate in CIC. So with associates, you, you can get the job in, into the field. It's kind of like more of an entry role. You're not fully certified. And it, usually when there, it's a, that's a new designation, relatively new designation. So usually you can enter IPAC teams with that and they, they're prepared and ready to groom you into a full um, CIC IPAC person. So that's usually how that works. All right, so let's move. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background and tell you, um, I think Vernette, when she was saying she felt like she is kind of not really prepared for the role. And I will tell you how through history people have dealt with IPAC and whether they were prepared or not, but they did amazing job in, in developing IPAC. So I always think about how any mythology is built around and um, how the knowledge of humans through history has affected and um, some written documentation as well as um, historical books and you can read about the 
a lot of the Roman and Greek mythology and when you go and visit any of these sites you will see how people were actually influenced by these ideas of uh, what we now know as infection control and what we now know as microorganisms at that time, they didn't really know how everything functioned, but they had an idea that there is more than meets the eye, so to speak. And um, so Hygieia, of course, she was a, a god of, uh, a daughter of a god of medicine, makes sense that something that has to do with hygiene would be closely related to the god of medicine. So then we're going to touch a little bit on your um, pre-1800s, uh, that's when we started looking into pr uh, early prophylaxis and wound prophylaxis. And then I'm going to talk about one of my favorite characters in infection control. Semmelweis is my favorite character, and I will tell you later on why. And um, so as we go through, we'll touch base more on surveillance. There is another chapter on surveillance in um, in future couple of weeks and then just take touch on these some of these uh, events in history that actually have shaped um, IPAC world so if you can think about something that will be definitely shaping future of IPAC it is COVID in the 2000s was SARS during that um, the pandemic that was uh, really hitting hard Toronto, you will know that that is the movement that actually has pushed and accelerated IPAC programs in acute care settings. And I now sitting a witness observing what is happening with COVID, I can tell you that this COVID pandemic is propelling and accelerating and breeding programs in long-term care facilities and retirement homes. I do also want to um, just make you aware that we do go through waves in IPAC. There's times when we are the hot commodity, so to speak, and there are times when things don't work always so grand for us and we are seen more as um, budget spending department because the preventative piece is not always in your face okay so okay so i'm going to show you um a picture so this is um, a map of um, an old roman settlement in um, modern pamukkale in turkey so i don't know if you can see really well but um they have um number five is actually what they had as um as a public toilet public washroom and if you see in the in the corner there is actually the roman old style public washroom so people would go in and when they had to relieve themselves they they all went into these latrines um in the in the olden times there were actually um, curtains in between so people didn't really necessarily see each other but there are very interesting ways of cleaning oneself um, after the defecation would take place so a lot of infections would take place through that uh, occurrences so there's some sticks and cloth and uh, not necessarily the best way to manage however they were smart enough to separate their drinking water and um, their septic water so if you ever had an opportunity to look at um, uh, if you ever have an opportunity to look into any of the old cities, especially the uh, the ones that are in, in pretty good shape, I will also tell you that in my little town where I come from, we still actually have parts of Roman uh, water treatment system, well, the plumbing really. Not necessarily that we are using it still, but it's still there. Um, so they, they knew how to bring fresh water, clean water, water into the cities, they knew how to take uh, contaminated water out of their cities. So that's all what I wanted here to share with you. I think um, this particular city here is actually interesting because um, 
it used to be something that would be referred as as a spa nowadays. So um, Pamukkale is that um, a, a, a little town in Turkey, and often you will see the pictures. It has these hanging pools, which are actually salt pools, and there the water in there is. Um, has been historically deemed as as um, therapeutic. Beyond the the hanging uh, pools, you will see massive, massive uh, graveyards where people were coming from all around the world looking for for cures for whatever ailments they had. Um, so, if you're looking, in, you will see that there is um grave uh tombs that are there is stones that are quite large and representing people that are coming from um money and then there is these uh, mass graves that people are from all walk of life would come in in search from for for cures or for their illnesses so um, I will fast forward into a little bit modern time. So I'll leave the ancient times behind us and talk about Robert Koch. You will, um, so just to, to make a brief stop here, please make sure that you brush up on uh, his postulates for your CIC exam. It's not gonna be many questions, but you may come across one or two that are stemming out of his postulates. Um, so he actually is the man who developed the Petri dish. So if you go ever into lab, I know um, many of you are familiar with what Petri dish is, and I'm sure you've seen them on a regular basis, but um, he is the one actually who invented it and developed those. So agar is in search for a good um, grow, growing ground for the, the microorganisms. He also has been the first one to discover bacillus anthracis, which is um, quite an interesting development for him as well. And then um, he, he uh, actually worked really deeply in developing his postulates and relation between the microorganism and disease. So uh, you will find that... Um, uh, Thank you. So you will find that through the, the um, development of microbiology, everything is stemming off Robert Koch's postulates and his um, view of the relation between the um, disease-causing organisms and actual outcome. So do know that. So I'm gonna tell you about Miss Florence Nightingale. Everybody knows. Miss Florence Nightingale. If you have an opportunity to read her memoirs, they're quite colorful and, and entertaining to read. She was a character. I kind of wish I had that energy and uh, demeanor that that lady had. When you read it, you'll know what I'm talking about. She <laughs> Uh, she she is quite a character, wasn't she? So anyway, she was actually one of the proponents of cleanliness and talking about antiseptic techniques. And she was the one who was working uh, in the uh, Crimean War. And the Crimean War was actually happening in the in the what is now known as Balkans and and um, Russia. So in that area under Ottoman Empire, the war occurred and there is a lot of, of course, in the 1800s, you can only imagine the wounds and whatever weaponry were they using and however would um, these wounds get infected. So she was actually dealing with a lot of, um, a lot of cleaning techniques around the wounds. And uh, she was actually really good with numbers, so she was a statistician as well, something that I'm striving towards, but not there yet. So I can get to some of my numbers, but not as good as she was. That's right, show us a picture. Did you guys go on a date, Leonard? How did that go? <laughs> so, um, Semmelweis is actually someone that 
I find there's many, many days that I do relate to his work, not necessarily for the for the better. Um, Semmelweis was actually a, a physician. He was working in Vienna. So back in, in his time, there was um, an Austro-Hungarian empire that was in established between Austria and Hungary. So he actually was born in Hungary, but at his young age, he moved to Vienna. And um, so when he started working in Vienna, he started working at their um, general hospital. And in 1841, when he started working, he has been observing events taking place. So there's two clinics in the hospital, one of which uh, was looked after the midwives and the other was looked after by the physicians. So naturally we would think the physicians would be a better choice and option for, for the young moms to have their babies there. <laughs> the martyr of hand hygiene, for sure. So um, he actually has noticed that the mortality rate in in these um, young mothers was much higher on the words watched and looked after by the physician group than what was happening on um, on the words that were monitored by the midwifery. So um, again, he didn't really understand what was going on. So there's times when he thought that the diseases are somehow lingering in the air and could be scared by the bells. So he was installing bells around the hospital and ringing these bells in, in hope that the um, disease causing air will somehow dissipate. However, that didn't work. And then what actually he has found out after a closer assessment of the events was that the physicians, they would go and actually perform the autopsies and um, come back and then deliver babies. And of course, um, perform all the, the post-delivery care with uh, to the moms. The problem with that was that um, hand hygiene was not something that was um, fully comprehended at the time. And um, physicians, lawyers, and engineers were gentlemen. And if you know, gentlemen in that olden times would wear gloves. And of course, gentlemen's hands never get dirty because they're gentlemen. So there was no need to clean their hands. So the numbers between the, uh, <laughs> yeah, nothing didn't change. Not much has changed, right, Jig Deep? So um, the, um, he started actually putting in um, a hand hygiene, implementing hand hygiene on the on the on both sides, and at that point, when um, the 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 numbers of the the death cases among the mothers have started dropping significantly, but. Um, Sadly, he was, he became a, a really a joke of the medical field in, in European countries and they were making a lot of fun of him and um, a lot of papers were written and not really fully understanding that the gentleman's hands actually truly can be dirty and can carry contaminants. So um, actually in 90, in, sorry, in 1848, that's when um, they stopped cleaning their hands and um, they went right back into spiraled into these high numbers. The good, good thing was that the maternity ward looked after the midwives was still maintaining that lower mortality rates. So a lot of young Viennese women would choose to go and have their children delivered by the midwifery program rather than the physicians just because of the outcomes. Uh, sadly, 
in the um, in 1965, he actually ended up going to going to um, a mental health asylum because he could not prove that hand hygiene can save lives, and that's where he died. And um, it is 2021. I know that's the bane of my existence, and I know it is a bane of existence of many of you, is the hand hygiene and explaining the importance of it and why is it critical to clean hands and that hand hygiene actually can save lives. So yes, you're right, Karine. He actually has um, used lime, which is the... Um, uh, caustic soda. It was much more harsh than alcohol-based hand sanitizers with emollients that are ac accessible now, yet we are still struggling with the same problem. <laughs> so this is why he is my favorite scientist, because I feel like that's, that's definitely the path I'm taking, heading to the mental health asylum. <laughs> Um, so the, the other gentleman that also has, um, has significantly marked IPAC world is Jon Snow. And um, there is a, a road of, of Jon Snow in Guelph area. And I can tell you when the, um, the Game of Thrones came about, the, that name was changed. <laughs> but um, anyway, so... Um, he also spoke about the hygiene and preventing the, the, the spread of infectious diseases, but his life was actually more tied to London. And uh, it is actually speaking, again, about a very similar concept about the microorganisms magically transferring. So they didn't really understand what was the cause and how was how these events were taking necessarily place, but they do, they did understand that there is something is, is happening. So um, cholera that was hitting London actually was um, taking place in relation to, to one pump in, in, in London. And he um, came to that conclusion and decided that we need to close that pump. And once that pump was closed, the um, the cases of cholera actually were not non-existent. It took some time to to bring them down, of course, but there was no no more um, no more cholera cases once it came to in power to close that pump. So if you ever go back to London, you can actually see um, the pump is still there. It's not pumping any any water, thankfully, or cholera, um, but it's there for us to see. So if you are like traveling around and looking for something to mark your IPAC career and take a cute picture for your presentations, you can do that. <laughs> Yeah, gloves, of course, Anika. Gloves are going to be an interesting interesting development after, and a lot of this PPE use is going to be really hard to put in balance after pandemic is done and over. So we'll have another battle ahead of us for sure. So then there is Mr. Alexander Fleming, and um, he, he was actually a biologist and um, a pharmacist. He, he was looking into staphylococci colonies. So he actually lived in somewhat modern times for us, and the 1955 is the year when he passed. And um, he, he actually was the one who d developed and um, developed the drugs out of the, the molds that were growing on in his lab. So he was a Nobel Prize winner as well. So those are just some of people that I would say have um, shaped our world of IPAC. If you um, want to take a look, I have uploaded some of their, um, a little bit of kind of review of their lives on our on our. Uh, week three, and there is also a little bit of that in week four coming up, but um, it's just to kind of get 
a little bit more intimate knowledge about their lives and that they were actually humans struggling with same problems like we are in now. So Burnett, I hope you feel better now that to see that people across were and through history struggle with same problems like we do. All right, so then we are gonna get into our um, a structure of IPAC program. So this is modern time and what are you guys gonna be dealing with and are dealing with? So um, and I'm sure that any one of you that is in a role has uh, some sort of um, program that is already established. You may not like it, but it's there, it's existence in better or, or worse shape than what you would like to have. But what's really important to know that you as an ICP, even if you're a sole ICP in a facility, you have to know that you're not alone. So you can build your committee and build your team that are supportive of the program and help you push through your agendas and policies and anything that you come in in your day-to-day -day operation that you have to have or in cases where you're dealing with outbreaks or um, any sort of uh, clusters on your units and you want to put a, a really quick stop to this is the group that you will be drawing their expertise from, you can rely on them. So we're gonna to touch a little bit on that as well. And um, what you need to, to know about your program, it is, it is not an isolated silo in, in your facility. It is, I always look at IPAC as a, a network and we touch on everything, on every little nook and cranny. We touch into every program, into every department, and we are in, pretty much in everybody's business, if you want to say that way. Um, it is critical for us to have support from the senior leadership in order to achieve your goals, because there is always budget around, uh, the needs and assigning your support and your colleagues' time. So that always comes with allocated time to, to help us. But um, also what is important, and we touched on that, is support from your colleagues and your grassroots support. So that necessarily doesn't always come with um, as big a budgetary issue as in once you're establishing programs and uh, bringing in director levels, manager levels, but um, it is a different type of connection for sure. Um, okay. All right. So when you're looking historically at IPAC programs, you will see that the earliest mention is around 1950s. Um, you will see that to, I think was uh, Anita asking me about who is at um, making up the IPAC team. So originally, of course, would make sense that was predominantly driven by the infection control nurses and the nurses were the ones who were appointed into the roles of IPAC teams. But over the time, you will see also that the teams are growing and developing and recognizing um, the need for having available different experts around the table when decisions need to be made, when surveillance needs to get started, identifying organisms and so on and so forth. So um, the part of infection control that is our bread and butter is surveillance. So surveillance is something that we do. Sometimes you don't even think about it. We are doing it, whether that's your ARO screening, whether that's syndromic surveillance and you're looking at 
um, respiratory infections or you're gathering information about the new onset of diarrheas on your unit. So that's all part of surveillance. There is another a larger section that we will be discussing surveillance in great depth. This is just a touch on this time. And um, also looking into programs that were identifying your um, assessments of um, housekeeping and also controlling that early infection control. So which we would say prevention really, um, but different different verbiage has been used over a course of time. You will also see that um, reading different documents from different countries, there are still different terminology that is used. So get familiar with, with different terminology. And also with regards to your CIC exam, keep in mind that is it is uh, an exam that is the board is based in the States. So there may be some differences and nuances between our practices in Canada and how infection control works and practices in, in the States. So then a big chunk that actually has impacted significantly IPAC is antimicrobial resistance. And this is, you will, you know, and you will see, um, I think it's week eight that we are going to get into antimicrobial stewardship when we get into a nitty gritty of the, ways how the organisms smart, smartened up and did they actually really smarten up or were they always smart? We're just developing, learning how were they smart all along. All right, so this is a really busy um, slide, but those are all the elements of um, IPAC program. So when you start looking um, into where would you want your program to be? So this will be kind of your um, a map to what you need to have. And then before you start looking into adding and taking away from your current program, do um, assessment. So this is what you guys started doing is your, your SWOT analysis. So this week we are gonna go back after the lecture and maybe change some of the things that we have said or add some of the things that we haven't said in, in that form that we have on, on our Google forms. But uh, take a look at where is what even you can take a look at your own programs for our purpose of the exercise is going to be um, a program that we are developing for the retirement home. So you want, of course, to have surveillance. You, of course, want to have hand hygiene program. That's a must. But then there is also other parts that are outbreak prevention and management. And that's always integrated somehow around your surveillance. Your IPAC policies and procedures are a must. And you always have to have them um, updated on an annual basis, you want to make sure that your IPAC policies and procedures are something that will carry you through accreditation for sure, but also will carry you through any events that may come to your hospital, including ARO, hand hygiene, um, surgical site infections. If you're in acute care setting, um, you want also to have anything around construction and HVAC systems. So your Manual really, again, will be a representation of your facility wall to wall, roof to the, uh, to the, to, to the foundation or vice versa. So it will, it has to cover everything that you encounter in a day. You want to have an antimicrobial stewardship program. It has been relatively a new development in IPAC, um, programs in IPAC departments. That's one of those programs that you work with other teams. You want to have access to your micro lab. Uh, you want to have to make sure that any products that are coming into your facility have been reviewed by IPAC team. Usually there is different uh, committees that would be your specs or PECs or whatever it is that they call themselves. It's usually the product evaluation committee. You want to be a part of evaluation of your housekeeping. What kind of product are they using? What are the procedures? What are 
are their own policies and procedures on cleaning for your terminal clean, your C. diff clean, um, anything like um, your regular clean, high touch surfaces, low touch surfaces. You want to have a look at it and you want to have a say. You're not responsible to write this particular policies, but you want to have a say. Okay, um, so Anita is asking, do I recommend that you write an exam or CIC exam after we complete this program? I recommend you write this exam. This exam is going to be in a couple of weeks. And um, don't, I would say don't start your CIC before we have completed our course. And I hope that you gained access or you're working on getting access to our APIC book because this is where your CIC exam is going to be drawing from about 90%, maybe even 95% is out of the APIC book. So you have to be very comfortable within the, um, the, the APIC book to write your CAC exam. This course is not going to be enough to, to write your CAC exam. So this is to get you there, get your appetites open and you know, so creative juices flowing, but it's not going to be enough to write your exam. So you want to make sure you have your process audits. I think uh, Vernette was talking about some of these like PPE and hand hygiene. You always have to be a part of occupational health department. I always see them as our partners. Um, we work very, very closely with them. It's critical for any events that you have, any Sentinel events that happen in your hospital or your long-term care facilities, any types of outbreaks or clusters, you work closely with your Oc Health team. Critical for all of us, and this is a proof that you guys are all in here, is your continuing education. It is of absolute importance that you keep up with the time. Sometimes it can be something like um, informal education where you're going and looking for information and reading up yourself, but it could be your formal education which you are now attending. Uh, so it is of utmost importance that you are always on top of events that are happening, whatever is new in the world you want to know, um, because it is a global global village that we live in. As you know, you all witnessed it. It happens on one side of the globe. Tomorrow it's in our front door. So other things that you want to um, also be involved with is education, education of your staff, education of the um, whether our patients, patients' families or residents. Some of the research hospitals will also work, um, have research done within their own hospital. They have large labs that can carry on the research piece of IPAC. If you're ever lucky to visit any of these places or you're lucky to work, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it, is, it is quite elating actually to see if, if you can participate in any of these large projects. It's really cool to be a part of it. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much your elements. Um, so I think I, I have asked Kareen, or I'm not sure anymore at the beginning, I was asking what does she do for a living? And she told me that she was, care no, it was, I think it was Angela actually. She was carrying, wearing many, many hats. So IPAC practitioners, as you know, are, we, I always see us as kind of jack of all trades. And I know Leonard has identified himself as the jack of all trades. And I think Leonard would fit right in with us. You always have to have a lot of knowledge from different backgrounds that are not necessarily uh, taught through school, through um, your proper and, and re regular education. So we have to draw our knowledge from conferences and sharing experiences with our colleagues, reading up, getting certified, 
conferences are really important for you guys if you can get into these no they're expensive but try some some of these events are organized on local levels sometimes you will find that public health ontario organizes events of course all of this has stopped all the in-person gatherings with covid but your local public health units will have events that you can attend so anytime there is any event that you can join that has um, any interest for you just go go and listen to what other people have to say and how they dealt with with their own problems um, so as i said um, in as an practitioner you will have to deal with um, surveillance hand hygiene product evaluation surveillance and then once you get your numbers in now you have to crunch the numbers so you're doing some of that statistical analysis reports producing so we had a little bit of a discussion this week about means and medians so you have to get comfortable with some of that terminology for your CIC exam I will tell you you will not not be asked to calculate anything but you will be presented with more of a definition type of thing where you will have to know what exactly they mean when they say odds ratio or if they present you with a case you will have to know what the statistical method you will have to use to produce the best numbers So for so I think we are getting to get to answer some of your questions with regards to ICP training and certification. So a good thing is that our college, Bay River College, has put up the, the course that you are attending and it is endorsed and recognized by IPA Canada. So if you're not members of IPA Canada, I will strongly advise you to join. There is again a lot of information for you guys that you can tap in and the body is, is just massive and I had always had amazing experience just picking up a phone or sending an email after I read somebody paper and people are happy to discuss of their findings and sometimes you will say oh, I don't know really what how to help you but I know a colleague of mine has been dealing with similar issues so you just network and you will find a lot of answers kind of start just coming at you so as I said your CBIC is uh, a certifying body it is in in the states you can write these exams here in canada electronically they're proctored exams so they will have a camera on you and you just get amount of time to write an exam and it's um with, with the first time you write your exam it is i think it's three hours i don't remember anymore it's been a long time um, but you sit down you write it and you get your results for the um recertification there is another exam it's called SARE and SARE is we get to be recertified every five years and for the year that you are due so say I am due next year so I can register in January and I'm due December 31st of 2022 so I have entire year allocated to me to review these cases. SARE is much more in depth. Um, it's usually a question that you need to actually do a research and some of these questions, of course, you will be able to, to answer right away, but some of them are really, really complex and you need to sit down and, and do a review and go back to your books and your materials to answer these questions, where your original initiating um, CIC exam is not like that. You can't access any of the materials. This is your basic knowledge. You have to pass it. Uh, yeah, so CIC exam and SARE are both multiple choice exams. That said, um, you will have scenarios. So you will have sometimes one scenario and then 
it could be up to five, six different questions that are relating or stemming from that original question. So you will have um, a scenario where they will say, so you have um, a group A strep outbreak in a hospital, then they, there could be uh, a statistics question, how do you calculate the rates, or there could be uh, a micro question related to that to speak about actual group A strep um, microorganism, there could be also some of the occupational health piece to it that can speak about the uh, protection of the staff, but also the risks of staff bringing group A strep to the facility, so that type of question. So they're not, um, some of them will be easy, of course, but some of them are going to be quite complex to answer. So I will urge you to um, get comfortable with all the topics. There's no need to go in, into much depth. I will tell you, for example, when because I'm not a clinician in background, for me, uh, it was really hard to comprehend the uh, central line infections, surgical site infections, cabbage, and all that. So I actually took upon myself to learn all about the lines and line insertions and procedures and types of lines. And, and later on, when I actually sat to write that exam, I realized it wasn't necessary to, to know so much. But um, you need to know the basic concepts. You need to know how does that relate to um, IPAC world and what you as a practitioner are about to do in relation to events that are described. So it sometimes is, I find it's really hard for nurses because they're jumping always to that clinical judgment and wearing their nursing hat where the question is very, very specific around IPAC practices. So you just always have to sit back and say, no, I'm a practitioner and the question is about IPAC practices, not about the nursing practices in this particular question. Okay, let's get along, move along. Uh, so you as a practitioner and um, will have to be actually, again, it's very similar to what your program carries, but this is what you as a person need to have a very strong knowledge. And so you will see there is epidemiology, surveillance, micro, asepsis, disinfection, sterilization, adult education, which we already touched on. So by the time we are done with our course, you're going to be experts on all these little bubbles around the ICP. Hi, Shelly. All right. So when you get your, to your CIC credentials, so there is, I want to uh, send you to the website and take a look. The, the um, recommendations and requirements actually have changed. So now they're talking about the first time candidates. Um, they have to have a post-secondary education healthcare related field. Um, also, you are to have some work experience, and so the, the around the two-year part-time employment, that's where you will find the most of changes actually have happened, and they, they've been tweaking this over a year. Sometimes they take that away, sometimes they bring it back, but do get very, very comfortable with these requirements before you sign up. You will have to write to submit your resume to them. You will have to um, write a little bit about why is that you want to be certified and why do you want to get these credentials? So, Shelly, Shelly, can you can you uh, mute yourself, please? Okay. So, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to tell you guys also there is a, a beta testing going on right now. So the, the beta test is uh, actually a test that is being trialed. It is a, a valid test for anyone who takes it. However, it, it does come with some 
mistakes or they're just trying to uh, test the questions that are coming up because they're renewing every five years the new question pool is coming out so this is the year before the new question pool comes out and now they're doing the beta testing so it is it, it does come with some perks but it is also it can be quite stressful because the questions may not necessarily be written in the best form and people may not always understand how it's written so um, this is what's happening this year with with the beta testing so as I said for you guys moving forward once you get certified we have to maintain our credentials and we go every five years to write our SARE exams um, it's important that you do create that network around you. I mentioned this many times before, and I will carry on with that message. This is ideal opportunity for you to network within our own class where you can use all the experts that we have around the table, ask questions. Uh, we already know from the Kyle is really good with statistics. Um, so we can go back and maybe connect with Kyle if you have any anything to carry on in future. I'm here to help you as well. Um, I know we, we noticed that Anita is really good with developing our little chart there and forms and Google forms and all of you have been sharing uh, information willingly and, and really nicely about your own um, Kahoot and what are you using in your own day-to-day -day work. So carry on with all of that and um, make sure that you have the relationships that can help you um, stay ahead of the curve, I would say. So when you're looking into, into um, your credentials and maintaining your credentials, always look at the freshest literature we already touched on on last week this is just a reminder stick with whatever is coming out that's new within the last couple of years revolve to 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 that sources for your cic writing i will also tell you if there is any new bundles that are issued that year um, by cdc so uh, if they're publishing any new documentation you can rest assured that those questions will be included in your cic exam for example the year i took a cic exam the first time the vap bundle came out i swear every question was about the VAPs in, in the ICU. It wasn't, but it felt like there was probably a good good 15% was all about VAPs and the new bundles that came that year and, and were published. Oh, so um, CDC will publish uh, reports, recommendations um, that are in, in talking about the management, just like you have here in the public health will issue, Public Health Ontario that does issue our best practices and guidelines or ministry. So CDC publishes these bundle documents uh, in the states. So I can, I can share some of these links with you after the class and you can see where to look for this, for this publication. So those would be your white papers. All right, so we already have, this is very similar. It goes back to um, what are the parts of program and now what is your knowledge and now what is your roles and responsibilities as of IPAC team, uh, as a practitioner rather. So you always want to make sure that you're very, very strong in your epidemiology. Epidemiology and also for your CIC exam, it's gonna be a good, chunk of your of your test is epidemiology so you have to be very comfortable with um, the terminology with statistic piece of epidemiology so get to know your histograms fish diagrams ratios um, um, standard deviation p-value so we will get into that a little bit more later in the course and there is an entire section designated and dedicated to this particular part but what I'm going to tell you is be very comfortable 
to know when a question comes up and they say, so there is um, an outbreak in NICU and these are the numbers, be comfortable to recognize what is uh, mean, what's median, um, what would be a standard deviation in this particular instance. They will show you a bell curve. You will not have to calculate, but you have to be able to read it and know what you're reading. I hope that makes sense. Um, so you as a, as a practitioner, and I know many of you have brought this up in discussions, is you are the decision makers and sometimes you will feel isolated in that process of decision making. You are responsible to develop and evaluate a lot of product and materials. However, it's not your sole responsibility. This is where you will be drawing from your team members or in the smaller facilities, your IPAC committee. You will have to know to apply your epidemiological principles. You will have to be able to identify what is a hospital acquired case. You will have to be able to identify what is a cluster, what's an outbreak, how to manage these um, events and how to prevent one from growing into an outbreak later on. We will cover all of that. These are just some highlights on what needs to be done. I'm going to finish this slide and give you a five minute break if that's okay. So what you will have to be able to do your research and this was our last week lecture speaking about where to find your information, how to sift through information, find what's really important and um, tweak the information that is in such abundance available to us to what is applicable to what you do in day-to-day -day operation. If your facility is going through any sort of renovation, you will have to be competent to oversee the IPAC piece of it. So that's your hoarding, that would be your building permits for IPAC, not the building permits for the municipality. So they actually have to come to you and ask for a permit to start demolishing something, put up a hoarding, so we will get into that as well much later towards the end of the course, but it is a big component of IPAC. If you end up in any sort of um, committee where they're building a new facility, again, a lot of construction, a lot of planning, sitting on a various committees with your pharmacy, with food services, with housekeeping, with surgical teams to create work environments that are conducive to safe care and so safe to the patient, safe to the staff. So again, you will be sitting from the IPAC and recommending and maybe taking some of these things away. So someone can come up with the idea that they want to have a living wall in a, in the a main corridor of the hospital, which is a huge issue from the IPAC perspective. So you have to be very diplomatic in saying nicely no to the living wall. All right, so then of course, involvement with your housekeeping and environmental cleaning practices. And um, there is, when you get into, um, with emergency department is usually who is working with any sort of emerging pathogens, bioterrorism and pandemics. And they're usually the ones who are steering these committees because they are the entrance into the hospital and they have the capacity and they are going to be the ones dealing with a lot of these issues. So you want to have a chair at that table as well. All right, so I'm going to give you a bit of a break right now. Let's meet back at in five minutes, and I will monitor the chat and respond to some of your questions. Is that okay?
Do we have everybody here? Let me continue. All right. So um, our next uh, slide is speaking about your healthcare associated infections. Um, or the course of time you will find that these infections have changed the name and they've been called differently. Uh, even in our lecture in, uh, plan, it's called nosocomial. It is speaking about, it's actually originating from, from Greek language. It's gnosis means disease and comion means taking care of. So it had something to do even back then with that, taking care of the diseases. When we are talking about your healthcare associated cases, you want to make sure that you're able to distinguish from what is a true healthcare associated case versus cases that may have presented to your facility or have been missed, diagnosed, and maybe missed that incubation period. So it's very, very important and for your practice, but also for your CIC exam to be very comfortable with um, incubation periods. And then most of the diseases will present themselves in, in most common window of, of incubation period, but then there is that short end and the long end of incubation period. So for example, if you're looking at influenza, the, usually the re, we would say two to four days is incubation period, but it can be as short as one day and it can be as long as six days. So when you're looking into attribution of your cases, you want to capture that longest period of incubation period. So you don't want to cut yourself short and say, oh, it was cut off at two days. And then retrospectively, when you are looking back into your cases, you actually truly have missed cases. That said, there is very clear definitions from ministry, from your local public health units. Usually your Ontario health standards speak about the, um, the incubation periods, what are the definition of a healthcare associated case, and what are the definition of healthcare, um, sorry, of the outbreaks. So you always have to follow these definitions. With regards to your healthcare associated infections, they can be bloodstream, post-surgical, urinary, respiratory, gastro, and skin and soft tissue. Most common ones are respiratory, of course, and your gastro. Um, also, some of the bloodstream infections that are mandatory for reporting would include MRSA and VRE bloodstream infections. So we are mandated to report this to the ministry and that goes into your Quality Ontario. I can't really speak uh, with regards to the reporting system to other provinces. I'm not very uh, um, aware of how it works, but I would imagine it's a very similar principle. I know in Alberta, you don't have 36 health units like we have in Ontario, which just adds to another layer of reporting. I also know that in Alberta, the ICPs are employed by the government, but they are sitting in, in the healthcare facilities, where in Ontario, we are responsible hiring the teams and practitioners, and they're working under the health, healthcare facility they're working for. So there is a little bit of differences around that. Uh, we can look into this. If you have any questions, I'll help you navigate through the waters of your own provinces. But basically, there is standards that are set on the lowest le government level. So it would be your health unit with the standards, with the definitions. Your policies always have to respond to that. So you don't want your policy to be completely far off your um the guiding documents from the ministry or your health unit. So you want to be in line with that. So 
So when we start looking into what are the contributing factors for your healthcare associated infections, uh, for anyone who works in a long-term care facility or a retirement home, you know that advanced age is a part, a big part of it. Also, underlining illnesses like chronic conditions are a big contributing part. You can always think of anything like diabetes and advanced diabetes that does take your patients to dialysis sessions, they're at a huge risk of acquiring um, any bloodstream infections, especially if they're traveling and they do receive dialysis outside of Canada. So those are things to think about. Also, um, if you are thinking about your chemo patients, or if you are looking at uh, something that is not necessarily related to the host, it is the emergence of novel, novel infectious diseases. We have seen that, we have witnessed that this year and last year. Also looking into what is prevalent in the community. So you will find that some communities are more uh, endemic with particular diseases. That doesn't speak about these clusters of um, acute outbreak events, but speaks more about what is quite commonly uh, surviving in this in, in this community. So say like measles in certain geographic areas where a population um, is prevalent either due to religious reasons and political standings that they are not immunizing their children. So you will find that those are endemic regions for measles, for example. Also, international travel. So again, anyone who is here today travels around the globe, whatever they bring back to us. So we have to be very skilled in recognizing diseases that are not common under Canadian climate or in within our own environment, but what can also be brought to us. One of those diseases that come immediately to my mind is malaria. So malaria is not something that is that we get in Canada. It's every time you see a patient that presents with malaria, it's imported. So they had traveled to areas that are commonly endemically um, dealing with, with malaria. So that would be that. So the cost of healthcare associated infections is huge. Um, I would say that the, the most costly is the life. And in case that anyone has witnessed a life loss due to healthcare associated infection and it's something that is preventable, you know what I'm talking about. You know how painful it is to the family. You know how painful it is to your frontline staff to lose somebody due to illness that they didn't come with. Also, I know in my personal dealings, it has made me feel incompetent, made me feel um, unable to perform when things do happen that um, are out of my control. So sometimes these things do happen and we as professionals have to be able to take that emotional piece outside as hard as it is and take a look at the broader picture. What are the risks? How do we prevent this from happening to any other individuals that are on this particular floor, whether it's patients or could be our, our colleagues also. When you're looking at, these are all a little bit older information. It's very hard to put a number to um, a healthcare associated infections, but it can be about um, $52 million that we know that on annual basis we are spending on just on AR roads. So if you're looking into C. diff, so think about what needs to be put in place when you have a patient that's positive for C. diff. Private room is one cost. Um, then you have to think about also stool management, whether you actually have macerators in your facility or washers, or do you have to go and purchase Zorbi or Hygie bags or whatever is those absorbent bags that you need to use. PPE goes through the roof, right? So we have to make sure that all the PPE is, is available to frontline staff, but also visitors. Then you're looking into housekeeping. So you will have something that is enhanced cleaning. So these housekeeping staff will have to work around the clock to make sure that your unit is maintained in the most clean way that is not going to uh, spread further. 
UTIs for sure. UTIs are a whole different, actually a whole different issue. Uh, we will cover them a little bit later, but I find them always to be um, quite frequently uh, misdiagnosed. We identify UTIs, the positive blood cultures as UTIs, not necessarily properly diagnosing patients. Um, the use of antibiotics goes through the roof through that. Antimicrobial stewardship does help with that, but antimicrobial stewardship has not reached as far as retirement homes and long-term care facilities in the same scale like it has in, in acute care settings. So this is just some numbers that I have here, but what is really important for you to know that one in nine Canadians will actually leave with hospital-acquired infection. Um, that's quite a lot. And when you think about that, most of them are preventative and are actually within our reach to prevent. It's something that we um, we always have to facilitate and fight for and be loudspeakers to protect our, our patients and residents and um, our colleagues. So we are the ones who know these numbers. We are the ones who see these numbers and we are the ones who need to report the numbers to um, your grassroots, to your management, to your senior leadership, and speak about these costs because this is where you will catch them. It's the cost that goes into management of events that are huge versus prevention. No one likes to talk about buying gowns and wearing gowns as a preventative through the routine practices. However, if you are if you are able that you can collect the information on the cost, additional hours of the nurses, nurses that have fallen ill and injured because they were overworked, your PSWs, your housekeeping, and show these numbers versus prevention, you're always going to win with selling that product. It is hard to get all that information because everything is kind of burden, burden uh, buried in that financial department. Not a lot of things can be extrapolated, but you can get some ballpark figures. All right, let's move along. You're right, Jagdeep, yes, um, the, the cost is always an interesting topic to, to, to bring people into the conversation, but also you have to be prepared to answer some of those really difficult questions when they do come about and um, be prepared to, to speak to more of the prevention piece and showing the cost of outbreaks on the opposite side. I, it's really hard to to get first to get to a point where you actually can speak to these numbers and speak about the importance of investing in prevention versus managing outbreaks. You always have to have a budget for that, of course. But if we invest in prevention, there wouldn't be no outbreaks. So you, I mentioned your infection prevention and control committee. So you will have um, usually um, these committees meet on annual and quarterly basis. And then you will also see committees get together for any events that, such as outbreaks, or if there is anything like, um, say um, a pipe has burst or you have a sewage backup. So usually that's when you will see your IPAC committee get back. You are the one sitting at, you are chairing this committee. This is your committee. You're the one who is facilitating the meetings, scheduling the agenda, organizing the meetings. You're the, the one who is responsible to bring people together. When you build your committee, you want to have a full representation from all your important departments. So you would want to have people from all walks of your life within your own facility, but you also want to make sure that um, you have some of those ad hoc 
member. So we'll get into this uh, in the next couple of slides. But what you really need to know what is the purpose of your committee is to review your annual goals. So if your goal as an IPAC is to reduce the infection rates or to reduce the um, MRSA rates, colonizations, or to reduce the use of Foley catheters. So whatever that goal is, this is your annual assignment and you're working with your teams to get there. Also, you will be looking into evaluating these results. So it's kind of ongoing process. So whenever you get your monthly findings, you're preparing your reports for your monthly or quarterly meetings, you want to be able to speak to your numbers, but also keep your team accountable. So you want to also have a representative of your senior leadership. You are obligated to report to them. So that could be through the director of your team or whoever is, um, who are you reporting to. It could be you. Um, usually it is a director level that goes to, to the boards that report. So we'll get into that as well a little bit. But you also want to make sure that you're discussing any current policies, you're discussing um, any of your organizational needs that are specific to your organization. You want, again, I mentioned this a little bit earlier about advocating to your resources. So you want to make sure you have enough PPE. You want to make sure that cleaning agents and disinfecting agents that you know are a one type of cleaning agent, that's the top, the creme of the creme, you want to advocate for that because that will take, keep your facility out of outbreaks. Again, there is going to be some of that assessment, whatever, um, a case of an incident where you have to review any of critical hospital acquired infections. So usually your meeting will start with reporting back on surveillance, whatever was the, the quarterly rates for your MRSA, VRE, CPE, SBL, C. diff. Um, you will talk also about your immunization among your residents. It's a pneumococcus or if it's a, a influenza vaccine for your residents or um, also bringing up the campaigns for the staff. Sorry, I'm just catching up here on the chat what is what is happening here. Okay, so your um, IPAC committee membership, so it's going to be you usually if it's um, a larger team, your entire team is a part of it. They may not always be present at all of the meetings. If you have a team of 20 practitioners, it's, it's impossible to have 20 practitioners sitting in a meeting every four months. So you may have um, IPAC representative or if it's a, a topic that needs to be discussed and this particular practitioner is presenting, so it could be like hand hygiene or surgical site infections or um, your UTIs or construction that is happening. So you want to have people who are actually working on these projects to come and present to your committee. You want to have your IPAC physicians, that's your, usually your infectious diseases physicians, they usually in hospital settings carry a role of a medical director. Um, you want also to have your partners in crime, your occupational health and safety. Uh, then your public health representatives. So depending on what health unit you are uh, operating in, you may have something as a liaison. There's usually a person or two who are assigned to your facility and they should be always coming and talking and giving their perspective and advice and help you gear your team towards your goals or if you have a problem with outbreaks, they will be there to support you. I find that often um, people are fearing public health and um, 
they're afraid of having them at the table, but they are your partners. They're there to help you, and I can tell you from my working with them, they're most amazing bunch and most supportive. So do grow a close relationship with them. They're amazing to bring you a bunch of resources that you may not have at your fingertips. They can support you. Also, you want to have somebody that is representing your nursing team. It could be, usually we ask people, we don't tell people to come. You will find that there is people who are interested to be a part of IPAC team, somebody from the nursing group. You want them to sit there, give a nursing perspective to decisions. You also want to have, as I mentioned before, your senior management team. So it could be your director, but also could be directors, of the, depending on your facility, on the size of it, you could have um, from complete different departments like surgical directors, you could have ICU directors, and depending on what is the flavor of the month, you may have these people coming in and joining your team's team meetings. So, um, Jagdeep, you actually can register. You don't have to pay anyone. You pay with we. You register with ministry. You you register your email address there, and also Public Health Ontario has the same thing. And there will be you just get on their distribution list, and you will get be getting all of the um, current information. So, uh, other. <laughs> No problem. Yeah, there's no need to pay for anything like that. There is generated mailing. Everyone wants your email address anyway. <laughs> um, so the other departments that you want to consider to have is your micro team, your lab people, of course. They're your partners in crime, your pharmacy. They're really great for your antimicrobial stewardship. You want to be a part also have your reprocessing. So that's now called the central reprocessing uh, departments you can have an epidemiologist. These epidemiologists actually may be sitting within your own department, but they also could be independently hired, working maybe with a finance department or research department, depending on where they, um, they get allocated, you can invite them to your meetings as well. And usually in, in, in facilities, I will also say that IPAC usually sits with quality assurance and risk. They call them quality risk enterprise, which is better aligned than with occupational health. And I will tell you why is that uh, at a little bit later in, in, this, in, in the course where we'll talk about the occupational health a little bit more. So your reporting scheme, this is what I was mentioning to you before, we as IPAC, we report in so many different directions. So you're reporting to your frontline, you're reporting to your management, but as IPAC committee, we are actually legally obligated to report to medical advisory committee. And that's also, these, these committee meetings are also taking place on quarterly basis. And you as IPAC, usually your director will go out there, I've done it in the past as well. So you're presenting usually your hand hygiene rates, your MRSA, your VRE, your CPE rates, and CDF and usually facilities struggle with one particular thing and they focus on on improving so it could be hand hygiene or it could be reduction in surgical site infection so depending on what is ailing that particular facility so you will be talking about improvements so for example if you're doing any particular project you're installing let's say PPE holders and you want to talk to that to that um, to that group about the events that are happening and how are you progressing, what are your obstacles, and usually you want to spin it in a more successful and um, with actually saying what you have achieved. I wouldn't necessarily go into this large group and complain about my obstacles. That's a different, different platform for sure. This is a short reporting and um, you can also speak about successes of your IPAC team. So if someone got certified, this is definitely a platform where you want to tell them you got, Jack Deep got certified in infection control or um, 
we got somebody who attended the conference or presented it. So these are the platforms that you want to boost about your team and tell them all about how amazing the team is. So the minutes are always saved. You always have to have these minutes available. Your accreditation um, may ask for these minutes, but you also want to make sure you do circulate them. Often they're posted on your uh, websites, on your web page, so they're easily accessible. People try not to bombard everyone with email, so they just post them. Everyone knows where they're posted. And then um, in, in long-term care facilities, you also include your resident council. So whenever anything happens that does affect their life, they want to know, of course. So as IPAC program, I think this is by now becoming quite um, evident. Surveillance is what we do day in and day out. That's our bread and butter. That's what we are making all our income from. You do come in and the first thing you do is your surveillance. Policies and procedures are there to guide you and to help you make some of those challenging decisions. And I find in my past, whenever I would come across some of those challenging discussions, I would refer back to the policies and procedures, say this is what is in our policy, it's in line with legislations, it is an expectation that we are all complying with that. So you want to make sure that we as IPAC, of course, are complying with the, with the set legislation and accreditation standards. You don't want to be one, one man out there and not complying with these standards and accreditation comes around and someone points fingers back at the IPAC department saying we don't either have up-to-date policies or we don't have all the policies that are needed to be there. So you want to make sure that our, our department is really tight. So, uh, as IPAC, we work really close with occupational health and uh, we will usually see um, one side of the same problem and they see the other side. So we don't cross into the staff um, evaluation, assessments, any of those recommendations has to come from the occupational health department. So us as IPAC team, we focus on the patient population. And then of course, uh, one of our biggest roles and most responsible and rewarding roles is the education. So we are responsible for our own education, but we are also responsible to deliver and um, make education available to the frontline staff. So whether that's through uh, your huddles, whether that's through the webinars or presentations that are available to them to download and take a look and peruse at their own time, your PowerPoint presentation, whichever way you decide to do, make sure you do have a documentation. Again, for the accreditation purposes, you want to have uh, logs that, whether this is training that's been provided on annual basis or monthly basis or however you want to break it down. So those are your um, a chart. There is a table of your surveillance indicators and this is a process surveillance. So you will see that we will use two terms and you will have to be very comfortable, especially for your CIC, what is an outcome surveillance pro and what's a process surveillance. So for your process surveillance, I have it break broken down by uh, different settings and what are we looking at. You will find that, of course, in acute care setting and your long-term care facilities or uh, complex continuing care, you'll find that some of those things are not on the same page. So there's your check marks, what you're looking at, but everyone is looking into your ARO screening, of course. Not, we are not looking into this at the home healthcare setting. So for anyone who is working in any sort of agency that are going visiting their patients at home, they're not screening their patients for ARO. But everyone is looking at your um, respiratory infection. So you're looking into screening your patient. So when you're either coming into the, the room or if you're um, admitting a patient, you're asking them all these questions about fever, travel, um, any of the symptoms that are related to um, acute respiratory infections. 
you're also looking into your screening protocols for TB, and you will find that we don't screen patients for TB in acute care settings. However, we do screen patients in those long-term care facilities where patients, the residents, tend to stay for extended period of time. <clears throat> Um, so there is, of course, your influenza vaccinations, pneumococcal vaccinations, and um, usually it is done in your continuing complex care or long-term care facilities. But as of uh, recent years, we've been involved also in acute care setting with some of our uh, population that tends to have extended period. Uh, length of stay in the hospital that we also were providing uh, pneumococcal and influenza vaccines to them as well. So that's something to think about. Um, you, of course, your MRSA and BRE for hemodialysis patients, and then staff tuberculosis screening, that's a must. Anyone who gets hired, everyone gets screened. You're getting your skin tests for uh, TB screens. Everyone is looking after your sharps injury and so on. That goes across the continuum. We are not missing on that. And then as you get into, again, more of a surveillance component, so what are they? You're looking into your ventilator use protocols. Of course, ventilators are only in use in complex care and acute care, so that's you can't be monitoring for that in a, in a home setting. Um, so you're looking also for your surgical procedure. Again, it is unique to acute care setting. You can't screen for your surgical procedures and preoperative use of antibiotics elsewhere. Routine practices, additional precautions across the board, hand hygiene across the board. So you'll see how um, the setting actually will dictate what you can do, look for, and and assess. No, you're right, Angela, we can't force anyone. And it's, um, I think vaccines are a topic that is uh, quite contradicting and, and brings a lot of discussion. Uh, we are not in, in, in a setting or environment that we are mandating any of the vaccinations. So we offer and provide education and hope that people will take it and understand, but also at the same time, you know, we are lucky that we live in, in a setting that we are not forced against our will to do anything. Oh, Bernard, I can hear your voice. <laughs> um, okay, so then when we start looking into the outcome surveillance indicators, we are looking into your respiratory infection rates that are healthcare associated. You're looking into your AROs, uh, C. diff, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal infections rather, group A strep. So any of those those are your outcomes. So what actually has happened? So if you're looking into your process surveillance, you will see something like hand hygiene is, is a process. Or um, if you're looking into your vaccination rate, so you're looking at things that are occurring over a time and you're observing that versus the outcome. So you have a set amount, set number of cases. So can you, um, Karine, can you maybe share it? How did you develop um, your, your rates? How do you calculate that with us? Me too. <laughs> okay, so Karine's gonna type that for us. I will carry on with this presentation piece. So for the outcome surveillance, the goal of outcome is um, what you're looking um, to, to uh, capture, really. So you want to make sure uh, that you're able to identify uh, clusters or outbreaks or healthcare-associated infections. Um, the <laughs> um, sorry, I'm, I'm giggling here how we are all encouraging <laughs> Karine to tell us all about her vaccine rates. So um, 
the surveillance process should incorporate a couple of these um, the elements. So that's your identification and description of a problem because you can't start working on a problem unless you have it defined. So you kind of have to have your framework that you're operating within. Then you're looking at who is your population at risk. So if you're looking at, um, say, uh, ventilator-associated uh, pneumonias, of course you're looking only at the patients that are on ventilators. If you're looking at um, surgical site infections, you would focus on particular surgeries. So you would be saying surgical site infections of complete knee or complete hip replacement versus C-section. So you're not bunching all these surgeries together, so you're kind of stratifying them. That's a good trick, Corinne. I like that. Um, so when we start looking at uh, selection of the appropriate methods, we are looking into our um, the tools, statistical tools that you are using. So I think it's critical that we start with uh, set definition, and then we have to look at the population. So are you breaking it down by a unit? Are you breaking down your numbers by a program or across the facility? So you have to be able to do so. Um, I will say this, if you're not comfortable using Excel spreadsheets, this is your lifesaver. And if you create your spreadsheets that are, um, you're able to filter and you know how to um, use your pivot charts and pivot histograms at the back of your documents, it's a lifesaver. I think it's a little bit of a work um, that you put ahead and then through the entire year, you're golden. So in the past, I would create my institutional line list and I would have in there the name of a patient, uh, the hospital number, gender, date of birth, so those are your demographics, and then I create columns such as MRSA, VRE, CPE, ESBL, and, um, and then drop-down menus. So with your drop-down menus, you're actually able to filter your information. So yes, it's a little bit of work, at the, to put a front, but at the end of the, the quarter or at the end, even like someone just walks into your office and they need to know what are their rates on their unit, you're able to extract that in a matter of minutes. Okay, so I'm just gonna say I'm fully vaccinated and I'm ready to get this preloaded visa card. So that's just a point to Crystal. <laughs> okay, so I think I um, I kind of hope that you understand how to get your numbers sorted out. Um, so when when you get your rates, you also want to know what you're comparing it against, right? So you want to make sure you're comparing yourself within your similar population. So you're either comparing your new numbers to your previous year's numbers, or if you want to benchmark, you can, if you go to say um, Quality Ontario, you can benchmark within your own um, geographical region, but you also can pick similar hospitals. So they're already pre-filtered for you. So you can pick, I don't know, I work in a large city hospital with numerous programs, so you will be comparing yourself with the similar hospitals. You don't want to compare yourself with a 20-bed hospital if you have a 1,000-bed facility, right? So that's what's benchmarking and how you're comparing yourself. Um, you also want to look into, once you get into specifics, you want to make sure that you, again, are looking into um, same type of procedure that you're looking across the board, so you're not comparing. You It may look on surface that you're looking at the same numbers, but they may not be exactly the same procedures. Um, <clears throat> um, can so, you share your graph with us at the end of this course as a reference? Yeah. No, I, I will send you a blank. Uh, line list if that's what you're looking for. 
Okay, great. I can do that. Yeah. So um, it's something that it's it's just I think all IPAC has some different ways of um, documenting this. Some of the facilities have much more elegant softwares that are actually drawing directly and extrapolating all that information from already existing systems. So I don't know, um, Epic would be a really good system that does amazing stuff. Um, so everything, your entire hospital would be operating out of Epic system. So you would have your diagnostics, your labs, your patient charts, uh, your HVAC system is operated from it. Um, anything, finances, anything, you name it, it's, it can be ran out of a Epic system. Um, and also it gives, it requires only minimal manipulation from IPAC team to get us attributions to these cases and it extrapolates all these reports not everyone is lucky to have Epic. Epic is a very, very expensive software that is in use. So in Toronto, Sick Kids is using it. Um, Mackenzie Health is using it. And then um, this year is Lake Ridge is coming on board and Scarborough Health Network. So some of these large centers will have it and not everyone will have the same same access. That said, it's really great because you see across uh, continuum. So if your patient goes from one location to the other, you actually can access their their charts. Yeah it, would be, yeah, it would be nice to have Cornelia at yeah, least. No uh, yeah. Yeah, I will share that. All right. So then we get into your policies and procedures. So when we start talking at the policies and procedures, any any healthcare has it, right? So you have to have your policies and procedures. What I find is that we tend to forget to update them. So we kind of revisit them as accreditation does come around. So um, if you can keep them always fresh, give yourself enough time to review them. Uh, you can also send them to your partners to read. Usually we share them within IPAC committee uh, and ask anyone to participate and do updates and review because it's a, it's a huge undertaking for one person. So usually that's what happens. You want your policies to be again in line with um, your recommendations, whether they're coming from your health units, uh, legislations that are in place by uh, your uh, pro provinces or federal um, legislation. So we want to make sure that we are lining up with all of the legislative pieces. And then once you get into um, writing policies for your own uh, facilities, you want to make sure that fitting your own facility too. So uh, it's sometimes we, we would like to have things in place, but it's simply not possible. So you will uh, state in your policy that this is a standard. However, due to maybe um, um, just the nature of the facility or the age of the facility or the size of the facility, you are putting in place your goal and that could be something like a long-term goal or a short-term goal and you're working on getting your facility there. So you are aware of the shortcomings and you're simply not a magician. You can't make things happen just because they should be in place. So recognizing that there may be gaps. So when you're writing this policies you want to be able to speak about that this is a goal and then you create your own um, projects for your facility to, to get them there. I don't know what that could be. could be something like um, accommodation. So uh, is it you, of course, you want everyone to be in a private room with their own bathroom. It's impossible in many instances to do so, but you're maybe working on right now dedicating commodes to your patients and things like that. So you're finding bridging those gaps in more creative ways. So you always want to make sure that your policies are in line with your entire facility. So however 
whatever the design is, the templates that your facility is using, you want to follow that. Sometimes it may not be your cup of tea, you don't need too, too much of fancy stuff, but follow the, the way they're numbering, uh, they usually have the um, authority who owns the policy and also you want to keep the when was your policy originally generated and when was the last date that was updated um, so again you want to make sure that these policies do link to what you're teaching so you're not teaching completely a different topic from what is in your policy so something is not right if if your teachings are not in line with the policy either you're not teaching the material that should be taught or your policy is outdated um, so that kind of covers that educational piece you also when you're developing your policies keep in mind that your policies will touch other departments so you want their input as well at the same token you as IPAC or IPAC representative you will be often asked to review some of their policies so that could be um, like housekeeping or food services or um, reprocessing often will ask you to weigh in some of their policies and procedures so when you're looking into your information sources, again, make sure that you know where you're pulling your information from. You want to use your surveillance data. You want to use your scientific literature. So again, um, back to our previous lecture from last week, make sure you're using um, reputable resources when you're writing your policies. You're relying on legislations. You're relying on your um, ministries recommendation and best practices and using that to uh, leverage your policies and your recommendations you also want to make sure that you do involve your professional practice so depending again on the size of a facility you're working often you will come across an entire department that is a professional practice department they are setting up their own guidelines so they're usually um, a group of educators that are keeping the nursing staff up to speed following any new developments if there is any new equipment they're the ones training the nurses so you want to make sure you're working very closely with with that group as well they also can help you carry the message because they are educators they are already on the floors and they are quite um, um, educated in their own uh, expertise and they can help you carry your messages because often IPAC teams as I said are much smaller than the rest of the teams in your facility and sometimes it's just you so you, any help that you can get is is great all right so back to discussion about the legislation so you want to make sure that you as practitioner are responsible that you're following these when you're looking for your own answers if you're looking for uh, any regulations that may apply to your day-to-day -day work but also when you are responsible building IPAC department or IPAC team and IPAC program you're looking into your legislative piece to respond to um, the needs of your facility so you're always in, in some sort of a balancing act between uh, complying with the legislation but also accommodating your facility so a couple of these legislations are listed on the screen so one of the big ones is your health protection and promotion act um, your public hospital act so if you're looking into any of um, the legislation usually you have these umbrella acts and then you have a bunch of reg regulations sitting under these acts so for example um, if you're looking at the health protection promotion act there's rabies act there is public water act under uh, sorry regulation there is um food premises regulation they're all sitting under this health protection and promotion act so when you're looking into your uh, 
regulations, they're a little bit more prescriptive, so they're addressing uh, particulars of and more details, where your acts are more of a broader legislative document. So under the Health Protection Promotion Act, for example, public health inspectors write orders, but under the regulations, the public health inspector write um, your tickets. So if I was to do an inspection of a, a spa or a pool and I found some infractions, my um, my ticket that I'm documenting and issuing a ticket to the owner would be under the particular uh, regulation. However, if I'm writing a closure order, it comes under the Health Protection Promotion Act. So I hope that helps you kind of understand the 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 levels of these legislations and then you get into into um, policies and procedures would be your lowest and then in between you have um, guidelines and best practices so like the, the documents that Public Health Ontario is issuing they're best practice documents and they're not under the Health Protection uh, and Promotion Act they're not enforceable so they're recommendation and in your work as practitioners you will find that you will be using more of these documents that speak about best practices than legislations and you have to be very skilled to then push that best recommendations and best practices through and that's one of the challenges sometimes that you will come across that people will just simply say I'm not mandated to do A, B, or C. Why are you making me do this? So sometimes you, <laughs> yes, check deep. Sometimes <laughs> it's not all the time uphill battle for us, is it? Yeah. So sometimes you will be challenged, but sometimes people will get along with you. And I think it all depends on on your relationships with them. And if you're coming across as credible and you support your decisions and suggestions with valid documentation, people take you more seriously. So another component, and I have mentioned this before, is your occupational health and safety. So um, I have a picture here of, of a boat and everyone is in there and I in in my career I always had um, a luxury and it was always a very tight relationship that I had with occupational health teams so um, you, no matter what is happening on your unit, you always want to go back and close the loop with your OCH health team. It could be anything from injuries, could be immunization, could be um, healthcare associated infections. You're always working with them. Uh, so if you have, say, um, a, a staff exposure, so usually there is um, the requirement from IPAC to report the exposures so the occupational health team can follow up. So for example, you have had um, measles case come through your emergency department and now you have to um, follow up on that case. So now it's been couple of days now you have your serology in you know for 100% for sure that this is a case but what happened in between is you don't want to leave people in in limbo either and it also helps you to stay organized so you start gathering your information so a couple of things you will need is to know who was working who was looking after that patient what kind of protection did they wear and then also with the occupational health you want to know know not only whether they wore proper PPE but also are they immunized or were, did, are they immune. So as IPAC you can't again I'm just um, trying to, to bring this back to you we don't deal with the staff so we can't go to our colleagues and say hey you know what you worked that evening a baby showed up with measles uh, are you immunized? A lot of people will offer this to us because they see us as colleagues and they will share that, but it comes under the Privacy Act. So 
again, unless you are in a facility where you are both, when you are in a single role as practitioner, you have to be very, very clear on the line of that privacy and, uh, you know, your PHIPAs and FIPAs and all, all of the legislation that protects our colleagues also from, from us digging into their privacy. So it's not a big deal for most people. They will tell you, oh, I had measles as a child or all of that, but sometimes people are not quite comfortable to share that. That said, upon hiring, occupational health does obtain that information. So usually they will ask when you're getting hired whether you're immunized or if you have had the particular disease in the past, they will ask you for the, the serology to determine whether you're still immune or you need any of the boosters. So they're the ones who who follow up with the staff. So through COVID, I'm sure you a lot of you have had dealings with this. And usually there is, um, again, forums. I can share what I have had in the past. I created some forums that helped me and my teams and um, the occupational health team to just sift through a lot of that information. So um, you can have at the back um, the what is the case definition, what's the incubation period, what are the exposures, so you can actually help them go through that. Often there is um, information that they are dependent to receive from us, and that would be that exposure to the patient, again, knowing who is the patient, so that information is um, we are circle of care to the patient, occupational health team is not, and we are the ones who are feeding them the details, again, keeping the privacy of our patient safe, so we are not going to go and tell them Oh, Sharon Fernandez has been admitted into ER, she is born in 1919, and I don't know, like all these demographics, that is to be kept for, for us, but we give the details such as time frame, location, um, the diagnosis, and anything that will help the occupational health follow up with the staff to so we work together in assessing one case from kind of two sides. Okay, so I hope that makes sense to you guys. If it doesn't, let me know. Um, also, we, as I said, we do share um, another couple other things. Uh, we do sit with them on the Joint Health and Safety Committee. And usually that's where you will have your union representatives, your nursing, your housekeeping reps, you will have your maintenance people sitting there as well. Um, there's going to be different types of nursing reps. It could be from different departments. You will also have lab and pharmacy. So all of people come together and usually we are speaking here about things like um, injuries that have happened at work or um, diseases that people have acquired at work due to the, the actual exposures could be in lab or um, could be on the unit. Again, we are not discussing the individuals, but the incidents and the events we are keeping in these instances, we are also keeping the names private. Um, also, with our occupational health and safety partners, we do often share some of the policies and procedures. Uh, we have to discuss, as I mentioned, this communicable disease status, whatever is happening within the facility, um, bringing them up to speed if we are finding any new infectious agents that are coming through. So for example, if you had a case of um, Ebola, say, come to your facility, you have to let them know so they can follow up. We work together, as I said, on post-exposure management. Then there's also some of the work restrictions. So that could be, for example, when um, somebody has a skin condition and they cannot perform hand hygiene, so we work together together with the occupational health to assist them finding alternative 
uh, placements for such individuals. So the nurse perhaps cannot be working in a clinical setting, but they could be working in an office setting. So we would provide them with some of the limitations from the IPAC perspective, and then they work with um, with that particular individual placing them accordingly to our recommendations. Also, we work very, very closely with them in choice of personal protective equipment. So you will find that sometimes gowns, for example, staff doesn't like them or they have allergic reaction, God forbid, or um, the gloves, they have a reaction to that. We had um, shortage of PPE through this pandemic and a, a sea of product has entered our facilities that may not be always properly vetted as we would like to and you end up with some of these reactions. People will have an allergic reaction or they don't like the smell of it or um, it could be fit also. So I had been involved in um, helping uh, getting gowns that are big enough that some of our tall and large staff could fit in. At the, at the opposite side, we had a problem with smaller staff and we couldn't find small gowns. Our nurses were tripping over the gowns. So things like that, that we work with them together and um, support our frontline staff. Vernet, it seems like you get a lot of these voluntold positions in your in your role. Yes, I did. No one else wanted it. <laughs> you know I, what? Often I, we, we I get it in compliance, you know? No, you know what? It's um often people will be voluntold, but I find you know, you have to find the beauty in it and, and, and make it work and enjoy. I was sitting on a Joint Health and Safety Committee for some time, and I can tell you some of these are quite comical. Some days you just leave these committees shaking your head and wondering what did you just listen to, and some days are a very serious uh, matter, but our presence is critical, and I think that's what matters the most, that we are present at the table and that we have a say. So I think anytime you have an opportunity to join, have a look, sit there, hear what's going on, some of these discussions are quite critical for operation of the facilities that you're working for, but also to our team. I try to make a party of everything. <laughs> You sound like a lady. I would like to have at my table. <laughs> and let's not let's not forget Crystal. She brings visa cards. Actually, Burnett, since you're enjoying yourself in this role, there's a couple of different ideas. But you know what? What we did in the first, I think, unit or the second unit, it was like these different ideas on how to make IPAC fun. I just heard of like another story, like to dip, like to wear gloves and dip them in chocolate pudding. <laughs> to imitate yeah. species and try to teach them how they're supposed to do glove to glove and skin to skin and try not to get the chocolate pudding on themselves or you can use finger paint or something like that that will come off but yeah so since you're having so much fun Verna, enjoy <laughs> <laughs> now i'm yeah. on a break now i'm on a break i, I leave that all behind for a while <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, there are so many different ways to teach and pudding is one of them. And um, what was the reaction that once you get the pudding on everyone, was it flinging all across or were it people was, actually successful? People were not successful. I think there was only like one or two. I did this in my previous workplace and it was just so much fun to, to watch them do it. And, and then they're like, oh, wait. I mm. thought I would do it correctly. It's not, <laughs> not so easy easy. after all. <laughs> it isn't. It really isn't. <laughs> okay. 
So um, I see that this is striking a lot of questions and discussion. I will just tell you that um, if you like micro, the next two um, next week is going to be quite entertaining. I like microbiology, so you will have. If you love it, you're going to be in for a treat. If not, you're going to be quite desperate Friday and and Saturday. So just heads up for that. So we may need to have some refresher refreshments ready for us. Maybe some chocolate. <laughs> Or something to pick us up if you're not enjoying micro because it's micro heavy next to, uh, Friday and Saturday. Oh, wine, yes. I just, um, I'm always afraid that I will be quite colorful if I have some wine. I'm quite colorful as, as, as I am without wine. So I always have to think what am I saying and how is this coming across? Um, but I hope that um, you guys understand that I have quite dry sense of humor. All right. Um, okay, so a couple more slides. And so we get into the uh, IPAC education. So we have kind of touched on it through through our adult education. So IPAC education training and evaluation, that's part of your program, right? So this is what is, we, we all have agreed that's critical part of our role is to share our knowledge. So one thing is to be in a possession of this vast knowledge and be the, the encyclopedia of IPAC, but it's no point if we are not sharing it. So. There are certain expectations that are set um, for us to deliver. So if you're looking for your accreditation, they will ask you whether you have set uh, education upon hire, your annual education, are there refreshers, but they will also ask you things about your hand hygiene um, and auditing. So are your auditors trained, but is also your frontline staff trained on the hand hygiene? So those are kind of, um, um, trainings and programs that are quite common and mandated to us to deliver, but also from IPAC perspective and for your accreditation, they will be looking, as I said, for the um, attendance sheets or quizzes or results. Sometimes they don't, but be prepared for anyone who is going through accreditation to have that on hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they do want us to show the results to the staff because it is critical for you as a participant to know how did you do. So some of these things that we do as huddles, they usually you, we don't measure that, but for your annual assessments that we discussed, your um, online access webinars and the educational uh, sessions that do come with quizzes, that's usually what they are looking for to have. Um, if you are going through uh, updating, I would say do include COVID into your sessions moving forward because it's, um, it's going to be on whoever is going through this accreditation, there will be questions about that as well. For your CIC course, also make sure you brush up on COVID, but don't forget to be quite familiar with the rest of um, the microorganisms, your viruses, your parasites, so we will be covering that next week. Um, so again, as I said, um, we are responsible to provide education and to evaluate. When it comes to performance management, it is not our role. It is a part of our program. However, we are not, usually we are not the ones who are doing that piece. That is always sitting with um, the manager of the unit. Sometimes your educators will also have some of that roles in terms of performance management. Uh, your HR department may be involved and also that depends all on um, your relation with your senior team. So depending on how are they seeing um, certain cases and events in the facility, they may recommend some of um, the performance management to be tied to um, 
back to HR and different types of performance management can be put in place. So we are not stepping into that. We will usually do the uh, education and evaluation piece. And then if you see that someone is struggling, I always say um, for us as practitioners, take a look and, and, and uh, see why is that particular individual struggling. Most people are not choosing to fail. They either have um, learning disabilities or language barriers or the material may be too technical to, to what we are delivering to them to understand. Sometimes it's better to show and take that time with that person than putting anyone through the performance management. I personally have not reported, I can't think of anyone that I actually went and report back to, to their managers in the sense that ask, asking for this performance management. Usually there is different ways to, to deal with these issues and um, I always think there is something that is running deeper than just being disobedient. That's my thought on that. Everyone has a different different style, and um, but also keep in mind that we are part of our own team, but we are also part of a larger team and larger group and our reputation is dependable on how do we relate to our colleagues. Yeah, so th that, that's, that's a good idea for sure using um, your, um, if you have someone that can actually help you interpret information, that's quite helpful. Um, other things is also show and tell, really. So that's that's a couple other things. But for for um, a lot of these um, like housekeeping and PSWs and porters and food services, um, their own management is responsible to make sure that their staff is compliant. So they may ask you to come and assist, but you don't. Use big uh, resolution of these problems. I was just writing show and tell when you said the same thing. <laughs> yeah, so cultural barriers and myths, you're right. So I think it is something that we have to remain um, aware and be very diligent when we step into role of practitioners. We are given a huge responsibility and um, we can come across as demanding and needy and pushy and so we have to be very careful how do we communicate with with everybody around us. So if you remember when we were talking adult education in the first lecture, we were talking about knowing your audience. So sometimes you may end up with um, younger population, sometimes you have more experienced staff, sometimes it's cultural differences. Um, for IPAC predominantly being a female role, that also can, you may be faced with some of those challenges as well. I think we are lucky to live in a country where it's not as as bad as it may be in some other places but be aware that people are coming from all walks of life and people are coming from all parts of this planet and may not be accustomed to um, the language that we are using and if you're coming more across as prescriptive and asking um, things to be done, there is maybe a different approach to that. That said, there's going to be times where you just give up because it's it's just not worth putting all the energy into into some of these discussions. But um, try to kind of get your larger group to follow you and you're going to be in good position. Yeah.
Um, so <laughs> that's interesting. I find um, probably more in, in smaller facilities that IPAC does have that responsibility, um, especially if they have a one person that is an IPAC manager. So there is the expectation from that IPAC manager to discipline the staff. Um, I think it's something you guys have to um, become and grow into, and it will reflect your personality as well. Dan said it's critical you also stand the ground when needed and be able to defend your statements. Oh, goodness gracious. Oh, yeah. So I guess there goes that that visa card that that Crystal gave them. Now they're being punished. And they're taking yes, that away. They weren't even gonna ask them any questions then. So nobody asked any questions to IPAC, which is the worst way to do anything. Because then that if IPAC, horrible. if you have a question and you want to save yourself and you want to do prevention and everything else, if you're not gonna tell them, they they can't talk to you because they're scared that you're gonna <laughs> yell at them for not, like why are you asking this question? You don't know this. Like that's not how it works. It's not about, you know, sometimes I, I feel um, the questions that are coming, they're usually asking to verify and confirm that they heard it right. But also people will ask questions because they're not necessarily understanding what we are saying. So coming from IPAC background, sometimes we talk in IPAC language and IPAC language is not something that is immediately understood. So you have to teach the language to to your colleagues and be gentle about that. And it's it's a process. It's not happening overnight. Um, I I don't know what to, to think about it. It's not really um, I don't think it's the best way to build relationships on fear. And we are all adults, we're all professionals, we all put lifetime of careers behind us to be where we are and um, that alone deserves respect never mind just thinking about last year never mind the careers that people put 15 20 30 40 years that they're working just in last year how much work has been invested in in life saving and you know, that is something that should bond us and make us stronger, not divide us. But that's just my two cents on it. I think, as I said, everyone has their own ways of dealing with things and uh, probably with their own experience decide to do and an venture in one direction or the other. But, um, you know, to each their own. We can't really argue what is right and what's wrong. You have to find what is right for you. All right, so when we get to our components of our IPAC education, so what we need to definitely cover is the disease transmission, right? So that's your chain of transmission. I am absolutely confident that all of you guys have the chain of transmission down to the science, you know how to take your frontline staff through it, what what are the modes of transmission, what are the um, portals of entry, what are the portals of exit, what are the causative agents. So taking them through that is really critical for us to deliver that, but also for them to understand. So if they understand the basic principles, what is a cause of something, they actually can put a stop to the problem. Then we have to talk about the, our benefits of surveillance. So every time there is um, a healthcare associated case on a unit, you want to go and report back. And one of the things that I have um, uh, experienced was that every time I would come back and tell them they were thinking that this is a blame game and uh, they felt guilty to um, to be informed of the cases, where that's not the end goal. The end goal is to make sure that our colleagues that are working in front line and they are our first and last line of defense know that there is a case and that if there is, depending on your outbreak definitions, you already may be in an outbreak, but you may be facing an outbreak in, in next few hours or days. So they can actually um, ramp up the defenses to protect the patients and prevent these from happening. So 
that was one of my struggles actually delivering this as this is more of FYI we are not blaming anyone and it cannot possibly be anyone to be blamed because when we face when we are faced with healthcare associated infections especially if they're coming in in high numbers that's a failure of a process or a failure of a system not a failure of an individual or or a nursing department so if you put it in that way um, and that we all work together to fix where the problem is, it does help um, develop that relationship further and they see you as someone who is transparent and sharing information rather than coming in to punish anyone and deliver a punitive message. So. Other thing that we are teaching about is your, of course, your hand hygiene. Uh, you want to make sure that you are training your frontline staff on your four moments of hand hygiene. So that's your before initial contact with either patient or patient environment, before any septic techniques, after the um, risk of exposure, so that doesn't mean that they're truly exposed to something, but there is a risk of potential exposure, and then after the contact with either patient or patient environment. And I think this is kind of challenging for frontline staff to dissect and break it down in a procedure and care events that they are taking place. So usually it's our role to help them identify what does in their care uh, sequence, where does this um, initial contact fall or where is this aseptic procedure or what point in time is this risk actually finished and where are we moving out of that moment three. So um, if you break it down with them and they become more comfortable in recognizing or giving them some pointers that this is when you want to clean your hands and this is not necessary to clean your hands. One of the uh, huge triggers for hand hygiene will be you. So every time they see you, they will clean their hands. Not necessarily that means any of the moments, but they will clean their hands when they see you. So um, that's one of the um, <laughs> that's one of the, the the trips I find that is always tripping up our staff. They do a, a little bit of extra hand hygiene, but you know any hand hygiene coming my way, I take it in stride. Amelia, I have life. to I have to tell you this one situation, and this might help everyone else with it as well. So I went into a home and I was supposed to audit PP donning and doffing. So when I'm there, perfectly everything, I even have a poster for this person. They just read it off and they do everything exactly. So what happened was the next time the actual home had cameras, because it was just that type of home that they needed to have cameras. So she didn't see that I was there and they asked me to sit in the, the room, like the, <laughs> the office, and watch the camera to see if they were doing it correctly. Nothing was done correctly. They had, it was an 8% compliance for PPE. She definitely got reined in on it. And then after that, every single time I went in, she did everything perfectly because she's like, they're watching me on the camera. So then she did it. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's, that's a big brother for us, right? So we all know we are watched, but also keep in mind that that also wears off, right? So um, if um, that's what is called a Hawthorne effect where people are aware of being observed and then they're performing in certain certain fashion, right? The thing is when, um, if people are not aware when and how, doesn't matter, we can watch them <laughs> day in and day out, they still don't know how to, right? So that's one part of a problem. The other part of a problem is where they just get completely fatigued. And I think this is a good example with COVID because we're constantly donning and doffing and it's just like a hamster on a wheel. You're on and you're not coming off with this. So it's just forever and ever in place and people are tired of it. I think, um, you you know, when they're aware that someone is watching, of course they want to do it right. But there's that part that people just get really tired of, of performing. And they're rushing, they're understaffed, they're um, 
sick and tired of being told what to do. So maybe it's a different, maybe it's a time for a different approach to the same problem. And um, again, yes, I, I hear what you're saying. A lot, we had, um, I've been in a situation where people were bringing food at night and eating at the nursing station, and that was caught on on camera. And it's no different if I tell you it's not okay for you to eat at the nursing station because you're putting yourself at risk. So if you're putting yourself at risk when I'm there, you're putting yourself at risk when I'm not there. So <laughs> Yeah. I, did, like, I did not really understand how, where does this, the risk goes out of the window because you're just tired and there is an opportunity to have a break and, and not do what we need to do. And sometimes being a little bit rebellious, you know, just gives us a little bit of a boost in energy. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's weird. Um, I had a similar experience like uh, Jack Deep. Um, I work in retirement most of the time, so I was sent to a long-term care to help with uh, PPE, Downing and Dauphin audit. So, and everything was on the door, how to do it, everything. So afterwards, I get the staff together and I was asking them, give me, <laughs> tell me how you do that. I, they could not tell me how they do it, but they could show me when they're in the front of the door. It was kind of weird, you know, it was. So um, <laughs> I think that I have been using, and some days I'm afraid also to say it, depending on what's my audience, and I will caution you to be very careful when, if you choose to, to kind of tug on, on the emotional strings, but, um, I usually tell them one story where I actually have lost a colleague due to um, healthcare associated infection. And I never tell them that particular story because I, I just can't carry through that story. The, what I tell them is we're all replaceable. One way or the other, when you turn around, we all work for companies or corporations. And on a grand scheme of things, when we are down a PSW or down a nurse, yeah, we will remember that, yeah, there was a nurse working next to me. And if she was really close to me on a personal level, I will remember that. But the machine needs to move along and we will be replaced. And to put a lighter note on that, I usually tell them there is always somebody waiting for you to come home, to come home in the same condition that you left your home. It could be your spouse, could be your children, could be that mother-in-law. She may not be always happy to see you, but she may want to see you come back in one piece because you're taking care of her grandchildren, you're taking care of her spouse, uh, of her child rather, could be that neighbor's cat that is sitting every day in the window and she knows when they see you coming, it's time for dinner because you have rolled with your car on the parkway, on your driveway. So try to relate it to what's important to them, not what is important to us. To us, is important that they're compliant, our numbers are important, it's important that we have delivered this education. Maybe on a personal level we care, maybe we really are tired of caring, but try bringing it back to why is it important to them to be safe at work. So I don't know, uh, again, I say be very careful who are you and how are you delivering that. It can be something that you have in your personal experience that you could share. Um, but um, that's usually most successful for me. Uh, I have had um, a colleague of mine come in and speak about her exposure at work. She didn't wear proper PPE, not that there was a shortage, not that she didn't know. She just simply chose not to, and she got sick. She got sick with COVID, and it was touch and go. So I actually used her to talk about her personal experience 
with regards to COVID, how did that affect her family, and how did that affect her life in, in the long run, and a year later she was still having um, side effects of COVID. So if you can find somebody who is willing to share some of those stories, or if you have family members of your residents who are willing to come in and, and speak about the losses. So that's usually that does resonate with people, um, but it's a different approach. All right. Okay, so let's move along. We are heading towards the end. So hand hygiene, we discussed assessment of your risk infection transmission. So how do you assess and how do they need to know how to protect themselves back to your PPE? So not only reading off the pamphlets and papers and signage, but how do you make it relevant? We need to teach them aseptic practices. So aseptic is not sterile, it's just clean. So that speaks about your clean uh, equipment, stethoscopes, um, commodes, or anything that is shared between the patients. So we need to highlight the importance of cleaning the equipment. And I think when it comes to that, it's important that we do know to share with them on how to. Um, so what's important when we say clean and disinfect? Does do they understand that means actually remove the gunk and remove that gross matter that is attached to the surface and allow for the disinfectant to have that contact time. Often people don't know that. So you will find sometimes people are cleaning their stethoscope with your alcohol-based hand rub and that doesn't work. It's not gonna clean it because that's not how alcohol-based hand rub works. It's not meant to clean your stethoscope. It's meant to clean your hands. So the alcohol that rubs between your hands, heats up, penetrates the, the cell of the microorganism. The drying action is what kills the microorganism. So if you just slap the alcohol-based hand rub on your stethoscope, there is no heat to work warm up that alcohol so it's doing nothing and only that emollient is building up on your stethoscope so you're not doing anything. So are they aware of those nuances and do they actually understand? So maybe you can bring someone from housekeeping to support you and show them how to, how to go from clean to dirty. What does it mean folding that wipe? Is it just bunching it up or are we using that wipe that is available to us that we can actually fold it and make sure we do clean and use the other side for disinfection. So that, those kind of things. And also, anytime you have ability to bring someone else that's not you and you're not that single talking head, always do that because it makes a huge difference for them. So um, teaching them about antibiotic, antibiotic use, your nurses are the ones who are going to be assessing your patients. They know whether something is to be um, alerted to the physician. So talk to them about the proper use of antibiotics and if their patient is actually following up. So that's, those, are your, those are your people to talk to, but also your pharmaceutical team. So you're working always with your uh, pharmacy, with your antimicrobial stewardship team, identifying whether those UTIs are true UTIs or are we treating only the positive urine samples and we are bombarding our residents now with antibiotics that is creating more resistance and so on and so forth. So have these discussions that are more meaningful and they actually can relate to. Um, yeah, so they need to know, of course, about the, uh, the blood and body uh, spillage and how to um, clean up immediately, how to protect themselves, what are the follow-ups in case of an injury, uh, also be the ones, there are your eyes really on the unit by the time we get there that train has already left the station, so they're, they're the ones who are going to tell you Mrs. Johnson in room 318 had fever, or Mr. Smith in room 8 had diarrhea, we didn't give him any laxatives, so they're the ones who are going to tell you. So 
encourage them to talk to you and to dig deep point if they're not comfortable talking to you about as simple things as education they will be frightened to tell you about diarrhea they will be frightened to tell you that oh maybe something happened and she forgot to report this last night but she put the patient on precautions and that's what you want them to grow into these independent individuals who are so equipped with the knowledge that they're comfortable and confident to make decisions on their own and they only report to you and you do your IPAC job. So, um, when you deliver your trainings is of course as i said always at the orientation so you will give them basic um, education such as hand hygiene arrows a little bit of a background on who is ipac what ipac does give them your contact number know how to reach you email they can walk into office if you're comfortable with that i always liked when people come to me um, and then also establish your ongoing training so they could be in form of huddles those are more um, informal, but you, as I said, you have to have your annual trainings and your check marks with the quizzes at the on the annual basis. Um, when you deliver education, I always say make sure you're timely in delivery. So if the hot topic on the unit is hand hygiene, take five minutes and talk to them about it. This is gonna be most invested, best invested five minutes of your day is when they're interested to talk about it. If they're concerned with something else and you're talking about chicken pox, that topic is not going to retain with them, especially if they're stressed over something that you may actually provide that information to them. Um, also, think about um, <clears throat> your um, situations that you can use to demonstrate. We, we have spoken about this before. In adult education, we addressed it where you definitely want to um, be more in, in a situation to show them and involve them in activities so they may actually teach one another. So I've done some mean things in the past where I had somebody who was very non-compliant. I actually picked on them to be my my sidekick and I would give them a little button that says IPAC Superstar and put that button on them and I would ask them to help me and they go and train people and let me tell you they will train people the right way because they know there, there's just a little bit of that you know, push back to authority or just because I can. So things like that. So try try um, different approaches on how do you engage those those challenging individuals. Um, when you get uh, new hires or you get students, you also want to make sure you touch base with them. Couple other uh, groups that you want definitely to train are the new physicians that start in. And also if you have any construction crew coming in, you definitely want to provide them with that basic IPAC training so they can, uh, they can remain safe, but they also keep your, your population agency staff of course but that's with agency staff you can be on on a perpetual training because in some facilities there is always agency staff and it's never the same agency staff <clears throat> so what they did with that was um they had all the agency staff sign off and have specific one-to-one -one training uh -huh. for their for their unit which i was in charge of to do specific ones just because there was always new ones. And so what they did was they got all these agency staff that were going to be coming, whoever is going to come, that they're going to do this whole education thing with. And I stayed there for like a month with one-to-one -one training and sign-offs. Yeah. <laughs> so so <laughs> Again, so those are your uh, at the, at the beginning, right? Before they get hired or before they start in a role, you train them. Um, with when 
I find every time I'm huddling on the unit, I invite everyone who is on the unit. So sometimes when you call a huddle, usually they will say, nursing staff to the unit, IPAC's calling for a huddle, and you just see them you know, just dragging themselves. They won't rather die than come and talk to me. But if you invite everybody and then you, you know, like housekeeping, they rarely ever invited to these huddles and it may not be relevant to them or they may not understand everything you're saying, but what message do you send in that instance is that we are all part of this team and we all work together and I have asked them also to speak about the challenges that they're facing on the unit. So, for example, clutter would be one of the things. So, ask them to participate and you will see that um, you're, when you act as, as that connector and you're gelling your teams, you are seen as, as a leader and they're seeing you as, as a person they can trust. So, um, you're startup trainings are amazing and necessary and you have to have them but keep on doing them as you're going and i find every time you have a minute or two to talk to them you're just building their knowledge and you're making them stronger and you want them to be confident and knowledgeable all right so let's move along we have a few more slides <clears throat> so when you do your education of course you want to do your evaluation so you want to evaluate their knowledge but you also want to evaluate your delivery so you want to hear from them how did you do and what else is that you can do better so it's not just for for you to get their marks and see that they have yeah check mark they attended or check mark they participated or they did amazing but you also want to continue improving and maybe changing the way you're working so that also gives a little bit of a different flavor and different interest um, also you want to make sure you also get the feedback from from your patients or residents so when you are teaching them you want to use a little bit different terminology of course and so it's more relevant for them so if your patient has MRSA you will be teaching them about MRSA they often worry will they get someone homesick or what are the risks for them will they get an infection so you are addressing dressing that as well yeah <clears throat> okay all right so I mentioned this before, performance management, it's definitely not something that we need to get too involved with unless it is our staff and we are managing them. This is for their, for their managers to do. We will report, we will report back. Um, usually when you report the rates and you go to the manager of the unit and the director of the unit or director of the program, they will ask you, what did you do to make it better? So you have to make sure that you have done everything prior to this point. So maybe I think Marina mentioned in previous classes that that there was not enough alcohol-based hand rub, so the cartridges were empty. So did we actually do our due diligence and address these gaps and identify where the gaps are and not just say, hey, you know what, your rates are so low, they're horrible, everything sucks, the world is coming to an end. So do you actually have anything in mind that is meaningful and manageable and they can actually respond to? So if it's training, is it they need more of the sanitizers or Maybe the sanitizer is not working, they don't like it, it's too sticky, it's stinky, it's not something that works with their skin. So that type of thing is something that you can give more of a tangible request to the managers that they can respond to and support you. Oh, Vernette. I can't take this. She's dancing at her huddles. <laughs> That's so cute. We need okay. So just like we needed a video from Leonard or a picture, now we need a picture of Vernette dancing. I am crazy, Corinne. <laughs> I love it. I love crazy. That's I, I, fun. I put, the, I put the YouTube on and we do a dance just before we start any training. So. <laughs> 
bring, share the link with us. So um, the next part, it's a really huge component to, to, your, uh, to your IPAC is the hand hygiene program. And the program itself is, is um, almost an independent hand of arm of IPAC. So uh, usually you would have the, um, the policy that revolves around it. You have to have a hand care program, which is uh, lotions and also uh, in, in co cooperation with occupational health for any skin breakage. You, of course, want to have education piece, but you also want uh, to look at your auditing. So. Um, depending again what's your budget, whether you can afford or not, there is apps that are available that you can use. Uh, there are softwares, larger facilities all have them, but sometimes we just simply have to use the um, the paper auditing. If anyone is using paper auditing and you need help with Excel spreadsheets, let me know. I can I can give you some of um, some of those um, Excel spreadsheets to use, and that may help you. But if not, that's great. Um, so that's one of one of your big. Um, <laughs> um, what do you need edited? <laughs> oh, the video. No, not me. Um, so your alcohol-based hand rub is actually a preferred method, and I think this is something that needs to be stressed and highlighted. The only exception when you're not cleaning hands with alcohol-based hand rub is when your hands are visibly soiled or when you're dealing with C. diff. All right. If all of us do a little TikTok dance and then send it to someone and they edit it, you know what I mean? <laughs> also, to that oh, you mean your hands as well, mm -hmm. um, you would also just be washing your hands, I guess, when you get residue. Because with COVID, we're doing it so often that you get that residue. Yeah, so I find with uh, the, the sanitizers that have been entering the market, we found quite a lot that had um, the residue build up. So with that, you have to be careful how you're advising them to clean their hands. So you don't want your staff to go between uh, alcohol and soap that's extremely drying, especially if you use soap and then those horrible paper towels, paper towels, they just rip the skin. They're like, like sandpaper sometimes. And then if you put alcohol on that, so you removed your natural oils off the skin with the soap, then you put alcohol on it, it's even more drying. So you just have to find a fine balance on when and how many times do you clean your hands with sanitizer? How many times do you wash? And every time they wash, you want to make sure they do use a lotion on their skin. And then, of mm. course, there's a forever on uh, the gloves that come in play and uh, how that actually affects the skin condition and keeping that in mind. With that cleaning, so I think also made sure that we just didn't put any hand sanitizer near the bathroom so that they weren't <laughs> using it. It's like all about the placement. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so that's critical that every time there is water, you don't want to put a sanitizer there because you want to encourage use of soap and lotion. Our company had this um, this uh, spray that they call Zuno mm. um, that they said it's 24-hour protection. So that kind of gives the staff like a, a little bit of psych, you know, I'm protected for the whole day even though I'm still doing my unwashing and I right. Sanitizer. So um, you're effect, talking. You know? That's a probably a barrier cream that you're yeah. talking about. So um, you want to be very careful with these barrier creams because they do protect the skin. You want them to. You want your staff to take it home and use that overnight rather than using that at at work because when they're using that at work in in uh, combination with alcohol it actually causes skin breakdown. No, so it wasn't the cream, Cornelia. It was a liquid. Oh, well, yeah. I don't know. Send, yeah. send, me the, send me the name and the link, and I will I will take a look at what it is I'm not familiar with. But yeah. if it's a barrier cream, that, that's an issue with be barrier creams. Yes, but nice. I know which one you're talking about, Vernat. It's the one that's not approved by Health Canada. So I know, remember, I had our IPAC people in there, and they looked at the Zuno, and they were really like, no, 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 we can't have that liquid because it's not approved. 
But then when we were trying to explain, so when we're now we were doing our hand hygiene and, and teaching about that, we also had to mention Zuno is not your ABHR. You still have to do your ABHR and then you can use this Zuno because it's not health approved. It's, you can't use yeah. it like that. So yeah, that, yeah. we'll get into into discussion of the products later in the course, but you want to make sure that you're not bringing anything that is not having um, a DIN number or it's not approved by Health Canada. So if you're in doubt, there is actually a database. Uh, I will share the link with you guys as well, and you can find the product that you have and whether it's approved or not, and what is it approved for. Okay, so let's move along. We are, we are coming really close to the end of the presentation. So other key components of our IPAC program are routine practices and additional precautions. I am absolutely positive that you guys are all queens and kings of the routine practices and additional precautions. That said, we will get more in detail as we get in um, week five. There is going to be uh, Saturday of week five is designated to routine practices and additional precautions. But basically it comes down to risk assessment, Again, the, the four moments of hand hygiene. So there is also a component of en environmental controls. So that usually includes your negative pressure rooms, your HVAC systems, um, installation of the point of care hand hygiene products, point of care for sharps disposal, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, your additional precautions are your droplet contact and airborne and combination of thereof and whatever comes with it in terms of accommodation, um, cohorting, cohorting of staff, um, um, limitations in transportation and also dedicating the equipment. So, so next uh, the part of important part of IPAC is your immunization and it's immunization of clients, patients and residents. And I think we have touched a bit on it before, but predominantly speaks about your um, influenza immunization and um, pneumococcal vaccines. There is also, for the long-term patients, residents who st tend to stay for extended period, you also want to make sure that they're up to date with their, um, your tetanus, diphtheria, and um, um, th these 10-year uh, booster requirements. All right. So when we get into your cluster and outbreak discussion, we will touch base here a little bit that all of our facilities at some point in time have been faced with clusters or outbreaks or both. So what you have to make sure that you as um, IPAC department, you're able to support your frontline staff while they are going through the outbreak. So you want to make sure that, first of all, you have policies that are addressing um, management of certain outbreaks. Usually your policies will revolve around a particular disease and that's how they should be. Uh, you also want to make sure sure that you are able to follow the trends. So you want to make sure that you're able to identify your healthcare associated infections and then in accordance to the um, provincial guidelines, you are calling these outbreaks. There's outbreaks like MRSA and VRE that don't have a set definition, but you need to be able to calculate your rates and then also establish what is your baseline in past years and then look at those deviant numbers that are coming in, whether you're oscillating too high or the numbers are within the expected ranges. So for MRSA and BRE and CPE colonizations, that's how that's working. 
Um, there is for CDF is a very clear definition, so we'll get into that as well later in the course. But um, you want to know as um, IPAC, you want to be very strong in epi epidemiology. I mentioned that before, but you also want to be able to read the micro reports. So we will touch base on that in week six. How do you interpret a report that comes across your desk? What does MRSA positive is very clear, but what does it mean when you get some of those inconclusive reports? What does it mean when you get COVID reports that may say, uh, talk about the CT values or may talk about serology or what does that mean and how do we interpret that and how do we apply that knowledge? <laughs> yeah, so those are kind of things that we need to know about the outbreaks. We, there is, again, as I said, there is an entire section that is covering outbreaks. We will get into detail talking about the uh, management of clusters and outbreaks and being able to recognize these. Uh, so your cluster investigations, what does that mean? Again, what does mean difference between a cluster or an outbreak? So clusters are usually an event that doesn't have necessarily clear epidemiological link, or there are the time lapses are um, too far to call an outbreak. So you want to make sure that you're keeping a close eye on them. Usually it could be a, um, a case of uh, influenza or respiratory illness, and you may have missed actually someone else who was incubating and you didn't know. So those are the, um, the differences that we are going to get into more specifics and help you kind of navigate through those waters as well. But also with your clusters, it's important that you recognize them at early stages so you can put a stop to further spread and prevent the outbreak from happening. In either instance, whenever you have an outbreak or a cluster, you always want to communicate this to your own team, to your management, to that unit management. The clusters are not always necessarily reported to public health. Outbreaks are always reported to public health, but also depending on your relationships with your public health unit, you may want to have this conversation about your clusters with them as well. You want to look into some other uh, situations that you may be involved in a larger picture. It could be that you are um, a link in a larger picture that you have one patient where there is an outbreak actually happening in another facility and now your patient could have caused it or your patient could have brought it to you now. So those are We'll get into all these nuances around identifying forward um, and retrospective um, surveillance. So we'll get into that. I hope you like that sort of a forensic type of work for IPAC. Your IPAC outbreak uh, management team is going to be your IPAC committee in a smaller version. You will have your IPAC uh, physician, you'll have your IPAC team, or that could be you. Um, if you have access to microbiologists and epidemiologists, you want them to sit there. Occupational health, of course, always. Um, and you also want to have, um, if uh, in some of these outbreaks, you'll find that uh, media will get quite a hold of your facility. So you want to have your PR person at the table. So first of all, they can understand what is happening. And we are not always um, the best people to speak to uh, media. So you don't want to say something that can put us all in hot water and more problems. So the uh, PR people know how to um, answer properly and um, not to cause more stir in community where people are already on high alert about things. So those are some of the people that you want to have at your at your uh, outbreak team meeting, but you also want definitely to have um, your porters or PSWs, whoever is transporting your patients or residents. You want your housekeeping management. You cannot live without them in an outbreak situation. And um, 
your um, your food services, of course, because they will have tons of questions whether they can deliver the trays into the room and can what they have to do, can they enter the unit? So you want them to be there. So the more of the, the, the heads of the departments you can invite to uh, ask the pertinent questions to you, the less will, you will have to field as you go through. So, and then always have your minutes and always make sure you distribute these minutes at the end of the meeting. A um, couple other tips I can give you is also uh, if there is any specific steps or measures, um, send that in an email as a follow-up to particular units or departments because it's much easier for them to print that and distribute to their staff rather than to memorize what was said in the meeting. So as IPAC practitioners, we have a huge role in, in, in outbreak management. We are the ones who are going to identify the outbreak and call the outbreak. We are the ones who are going to um, see the end to it and also declare the outbreak over. Um, so usually these outbreaks are called in the meeting. So before you call the outbreak, you call a pre-outbreak meeting where you tell present your case, tell them what's going on. And um, so usually you want to give people an idea when are we the earliest out of this outbreak and what are the measures and steps we need to follow to get us out of it. So that's kind of more of your communica communication piece. But then from the kind of back end that no one really sees except you is your surveillance, cal calculating your rates, communicating this to public health. You may or may not be involved with um, communicating to families and the patients, but you may be involved in creating that communication if it is a written communication. So you may be asked to write a letter or a fact sheet, something to support that communication. All right, so um, we come to the end. I know we took a little bit longer than um, our allocated time, but um, I just want to say thank you all for being so engaged today and participating. I feel that um, this was an interesting topic for you and I hope that next week micro is going to be also interesting and that you are going to have just as, as good conversation. So is there any questions that you guys have for me? Or is there anything that wasn't clear or that you would like me to repeat? You're very welcome. I'm so glad you enjoyed the class. So if you guys have any questions with regards to CIC, um, if you have um, any questions that I can help you narrow down and how to study about this, I'm happy to answer these questions. Um, just let me know. You can either post it in our discussion or send me email directly. Um, do we have class tomorrow or it's next week? We have Friday yeah. and Saturday. So we are done for today. And so week four and week five, are we are going to have Friday and Saturday because both lectures are quite massive in coverage. Micro is really, really big. And I'm not going to lie to you. I will, we will have to go through it. It's a lot of material to cover. And uh, it does, it will take us two days and then we will have to carry on that week through the discussion to um, make sure you guys are comfortable with the, the topic and you can further study for CIC because what I teach you in the in Friday and Saturday session will not be enough to for you to pass but it will be enough to give you an idea what you need to study okay great 
All right. So let's wrap up and uh, thank you again for your attendance and thank you for your patience for last week.